Now, if you're going to be working in any type of Microsoft administration services these days, there are some fundamental principles that are very important that you understand. So what I want to do is I want to get into some of the foundations of understanding things like Microsoft domains, understanding some of the networking technologies, RAS and VPNs and virtualization, and also we're going to talk about the cloud services and how all that fits into this. But it's important to kind of start from the beginning so you can understand where things have been, understand where things are going, and you have to consider the fact that you know we're, the world is transitioning now more into a cloud-oriented uh, environment, but in the past everything was managed on-prem or on-premise, and we got to talk about this transition and how things were and how things are now and where Microsoft is going. So to start with, you know, we go back go back in time to the 1950s, 1960s. They had mainframes, these gigantic computers that would take up like entire rooms. Uh, they used vacuum tubes. And then as we moved into the 1970s, something miraculous happened. They created what was known as an IC, an integrated circuit, which allowed uh, basically binary math to be processed through little chips and this is where personal computing became popular so in the 1980s personal computers started coming out I'm gonna draw this little symbol here to represent a computer and uh, I tell you what I'm gonna create another little uh, symbol here to kind of represent a bunch of computers so in the 1980s companies started buying PCs and personal computers and they started showing up in people's offices and eventually you know they were networking them together and all of that and so this is where things really get started now of course in in those days one of the problems was we we lived in what was called a peer-to-peer -peer network so what would happen is these computers were you could network these computers together with various technologies but um, there was no centralization, meaning each computer was equal. There was no computer that controls all the other computers. A network admin would have to, uh, if they wanted to make changes, they'd have to sit down at each and every computer to make those changes or get users to help them, which was always a nightmare. Um, and so that didn't, you know, it worked, but it didn't work very efficiently. All right. Now, as we moved into the 1990s, there was a, a company. That kept that was gaining ground called Novell, Novell, and they had a product called Netware, which was the idea of that was to use a server that would help manage uh, machines and also allow people to share files easier. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer network back originally, these machines would have to share files with each other, and people would have to know each other's passwords. It just didn't work very well. Well, eventually, with the creation of the file server concept, you had a more powerful machine that you could share files on and all that. And eventually Novell even came out with the idea of a server that could manage other machines. Now this is kind of where Microsoft comes in. Microsoft created their product called NT and they created this uh, concept of a domain controller which is a special type of server that can manage these other servers. Now fast forward they came out with what was known as a domain but fast forward to the year 2000 Microsoft releases their newest domain technology and they call it uh, Active Directory and Active Directory domains were represented by a triangle alright and a domain controller was a a server essentially that had a database on it and that database was the Active Directory database so let's just kinda fix that here this little cylinder looking thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent my Active Directory database so uh, AD alright um, and this was is what we still call to this day we call it ADDS Active Directory Domain Services and usually if you hear that term uh, Active Directory Domain Services it means it's an on-premise domain Although there is a version of this that can be hosted in the cloud known as Azure Active Directory Domain Services. I'm not getting into that right now. So anyway, um, you would always want to have more than one domain controller. You, the reason you want to have more than one domain controller is because the same reason you have more than one of any type of, of server really. One reason being 
um, to break up the disbursement of load, these machines will authenticate with these domain controllers. And the more machines you got, uh, you know, you don't want all of that just going to one domain controller, right? The other consideration is redundancy. If you only have one and that server goes down, well, you're in trouble, right? So we want to have multiple. The other thing about domain controllers that are interesting is that they replicate. So, uh, for example, let me make a, I'm going to make a little smiley face guy here. And this little smiley face guy is going to represent uh, my a user. So we create a user account on a domain controller. Now, the interesting thing about user accounts or the interesting thing really about domain controllers is that they replicate so everything you do on one uh, will replicate over to the other so if I create a user account on that first one well replication is going to occur between uh, both of them and so this little arrow thing I'm going to make here is going to represent replication so domain controllers replicate that means that this user could log on to any one of these thousands of machine and it's going to you know, authenticate with the uh, domain controller, all right? The authentication protocol that uh, is used is the protocol known as Kerberos, all right? Kerberos is the authentication uh, protocol. What is a protocol? It's like a language, basically, okay? Uh, now, there was an older protocol that that, uh, that it also supported called NTLM. That was for legacy for older prior to the year 2000 machines. Now, the um, that protocol allowed us to have encrypted passwords and all that and authenticate securely and all that fun stuff. The other thing is, is Active Directory uses a language um, known as the Directory Service Language, and that language was called LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Now, all that is, again, this is all decades old at this point. Um, at the time when it came out, it was cutting edge, but it's, it is a bit dated nowadays. Uh, but it still works and it's still pretty secure, though there are some considerations on security that I'm not going to explain right now. Now, the other thing that's important about Active Directory is that all machines have to have a name. And the name must be, of course, associated with an IP address and, and all of that. And so there is a service that we use that we use it on the Internet all the time called DNS, Domain Name Service. Our, our uh, domain must have a name. Usually when you name your domain, you would name it after your company, and a lot of people even name their domains based on their web presence. So, for example, my domain might be called examlabpractice.com. That's my company, my web presence. And um, I'm going to need to have a, a server in my domain that can associate the names and IP addresses together. So that server is called a DNS server. DNS, Domain Name System Server. And that server will also have to have a little database on it. And that database will be our DNS database. Okay. So we'll just draw another little cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, border it with red, and then I'm going to color code the database red, which means that this database, the DNS database, is associated with that name. Now what happens is our machines clients, domain chores, we also might even have, let's, let's draw a file server over here. Pretty common that we have file servers in our environment. Okay, um, all of these machines would register with our DNS. All right, and this allows for the centralization of name resolution, meaning they register their IP addresses into this database and then now, anytime a machine needs to find another machine, it can query DNS. So, for example, these machines all have to authenticate by your domain controllers. They can query DNS and say, hey, DNS, do you know what the uh, address is of one of my domain controllers so I can authenticate? And DNS can reply back and say, yeah, here is the information. At that point, the client can go and authenticate. So it works very efficiently. Now, all of this together... This, this idea of domain controllers, this triangle you see here, this provides centralization. So we, we moved away from peer-to-peer -peer networking back in the day where you know every machine was kind of its own boss and there was no centralized way of managing things to now we are working in a centralized environment. These domain controllers help us centralize. This DNS service help, helps us centralize. So we now have some central control over things. One of the great things about our 
uh, domain controllers too, is we have these wonderful things called GPOs, group policy objects. A group policy object is this object that you can create that has all these settings, parameters, uh, you know, any type of attribute you want to configure or change in, on machines, you can do it through a GPO. So for example, if your boss walks up to you and says, hey, I want you to um, force the firewalls to be turned on all these machines. I want to make sure that the antivirus is always up to date. Uh, I want you to disable some of the, the wallpaper feature. I don't want people you, uh, putting crazy wallpapers on their machine. Um, so, I mean, you could, the sky's the limit. There are literally thousands of things you can do inside of a GPO. But what happens is that GPO can instruct these machines to turn things on and turn things off. GPOs also replicate. So when you create a GPO on a domain controller, it replicates over to the other domain controller. So it doesn't matter which machines you know, authenticate with which domain controller. All right, so these GPOs can be deployed out to these machines, and this is how you turn things on, turn things off. You could even deploy software with that if you wanted to. So it was, a, it was very, very powerful, um, a very, very powerful system for managing everything. All right, uh, of course, let's let's throw the internet into the mix here. Let's say that this little cloud is going to represent the, uh, you know, the internet, and um, let's talk about kind of a little bit about how that sort of fits into the picture. Let me just clean it up here with the mighty stroke of my paintbrush. I will clean up the internet. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so then we have the internet, right? So maybe we've got an internet connection that's coming in here. All right, and of course you don't want to just leave your internal network exposed, so your company would generally have a firewall, right? Um, and we would, we'll just put that firewall right here. And so now we have... Um, you know, a secure way for traffic to flow out to the internet and uh, the only things that can come in would be things that we send out and we could allow things through that firewall if we want to. Now this is a traditional domain. This is the way we've done things for 20 years, all right? Um, and in this next little section I want to talk about uh, expansion on all of this and where where things have gone with things like RAS and all that and VPN and virtualization. So um, that'll wrap this little section up and we'll move on to the next. I now want to talk about some concepts that are also sort of the foundation of how we've done things over the years. It's important to understand how we've done things over the years so we can understand how uh, things are now. So looking back we have an Active Directory domain, ADDS as it's called, Active Directory Domain Services, which uses the LDAP Lightweight Director Access Protocol, which uses Kerberos for authentication or for this older, for the legacy back in the 90s devices that used NTLM, a new technology land manager, which is, isn't all very new these days. But uh, even Kerberos is pretty old con uh, considering you know, we've been using it for, for decades and I think actually the protocol even came out back in the 1980s. So, you know, so we got some data technologies, but the technologies have been updated a lot of them over the years to be secure. So you can still feel comfortable using those. But let's talk about some different scenarios now. Um, the first thing I want to look at is the scenario of what happens when we have a user who is not at the office. So this person is working from home. Working from home is a lot more popular nowadays than it has been in the past. So it's very common. And this person needs the ability, perhaps, to you know be able to connect in and access uh, services that are inside. Okay, um, and we've got a file server, but you know ultimately, we we you probably are aware that you know in the past um, it was always this mindset of do it yourself, host your own server. So you know your companies might have they might have a file server. But then they might also have a, um, you know, they might be, they might have a SQL database server that that users need to access. Let's let's create that SQL. All right. Um, maybe uh, Microsoft Exchange. That was email, right? Microsoft Exchange was, uh, you know, used for email, and then maybe even like SharePoint was very popular. 
by Microsoft on premise. So here you've got these, you know, these four servers providing a service to our devices, and um, you've got users working from home and everything else needing to get access to those. Let me just kind of move those a little bit over here, make a little bit of room here, and I'm going to shrink those down just a little bit as well. All right. So th this user who is working from home needs to access these services, but the person is not, uh, you know, not around. Well, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just open up all the ports on the firewall and allow this person in to get access to these um, devices unsecurely. In fact, in the 90s, a lot of companies did that. The very first company I ever worked for, uh, back in the 90s, they didn't really have a firewall, so you literally could share out your, you had a public address, and uh, you could connect to it from home. It was really scary when I think about it. Even in the 90s, that was scary. But nowadays, it's incredibly scary. Why is it scary? Because you got these people out there that want to do things that um, they shouldn't do and, and you know, get access to companies' data and, and try to do damage and ransom and all of that, ransomware and all that. And, and who are these people? Well, we, we generally call them hackers, right? So let me draw a little hacker, this, uh, this little... This little uh, box here is going to represent my hacker. All right, and let's make him. Let's make this hacker look like he's up to no good. All right, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna give him like a. Let's give him like a devil horns. Some devil horns here, and maybe like, uh, you know, he's he's in a bad mood. I'm gonna give him a frowny face. And give him some fangs and. Maybe the fangs are dripping blood every... Okay, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I get carried away. All right. But uh, anyway, that's going to be my hacker, all right? Goofy-looking little hacker person, all right? And um, so we don't want this hacker, like, spying on my user. We don't want this hacker getting access to resources inside. So how do we get around that? Well, usually the way we would do that is you would use a VPN, a virtual private network. So... The way you would do that is you could purchase what was called a VPN concentrator. And basically, it's a device that um, allows secure connections in. But in the Microsoft world, we actually had a type of server we could set up uh, called a RAS server, or also known as an RRAS server because it stood for Routing and Remote Access Services. But um, anyway, Remote Access Services is the idea here. And with that, we have support for VPN. Now, what does that do? This allows this thing called a VPN tunnel to be created, which means that you have this encrypted communications that goes through to that RAS server. And then from there, that RAS server allows you to access other resources securely. This hacker will not be able to see the, um, the traffic that's flowing through because it's all encrypted. The only thing the hacker would be able to see is that it was going up to this firewall, and that would be it wouldn't be able to see what the traffic said. So this is how we would we would definitely help secure things. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about here is what happens when a company needs to have a service that is exposed to the internet. For example, let's say that your company is going to host their own web server. Okay, so you set up a web server. All right. Maybe this is going to be www.examlabpractice.com or whatever, and people from the internet need to be able to get to it anonymously. Um, well, how are you going to do that? Where are you going to put that web server? Are you going to put it internally inside the domain like you see here? And the reason that's scary is because you would have to open up port 443, port 80, which is HTTP, HTTP ports to allow traffic to get in, which means... Not only could you know somebody out there on the internet anonymously get into this web server, but technically so could a hacker. And if a hacker was ever to gain access over this website by hacking it, then something called pivoting could occur, where a hacker could actually gain access to these other services that are on your network. And so that's where things are really scary. So you definitely won't want to host it internally most of the time, although there was a way to do something called a reverse proxy. I won't get into that right now. But we would probably want to put this outside, right? So we want to put it out here. Um, but there's something else that's a problem on that. If you put it outside that firewall, you don't have to worry about you know people getting you know allowing traffic to come in. But the only that the scary thing about that is the fact that this poor web server is now completely exposed to the internet, so with no protection. So the way around that 
usually is people would get another firewall. So you'd have two firewalls. This first firewall was, would be called the uh, internal connected firewall, and then you, this firewall here would be called the external connected firewall. Now this little network between that, we would call that a DMZ, demilitarized zone, or now the more popular term is perimeter network. Okay, so DMZ, perimeter network are basically the same thing. All right, um, and so now what you would do is you'd only open, you would only open the ports like port 80, 443, 53 for DNS if you put DNS in there, uh, whatever ports there that you need, and now traffic would be able to get to this web server. Okay, um, and so uh, even if a hacker, you know, somehow hacks this web server, you're not going to allow traffic to pass through this firewall and get to these resources. The only traffic that you might allow would be VPN. Okay. Um, and, and there's a bunch of authentication and all that that has to happen to make that work. All right, so that's the idea of remote access and VPNs in a nutshell for you, as well as the concept of DMZ and uh, the perimeter network idea. Uh, now, the, the final thing I wanna look at with you um, in this video is the idea of virtualization. So I talked about how in the past, uh, it was always the, the mindset was we got to host everything ourselves. We got to have our own little data center. We got to have our, you know, we got to have our own servers, file, server, SQL, Exchange, SharePoint, all that. And it's all got to be hosted by us. And that's the way things have always been done. All right. Um, now, uh, then what you'll find is, is as time went on, uh, a company called VMware came out with a uh, a way of expanding on virtualization. Just so you know, virtualization is not a new term. Virtualization has been around for a very long time. In fact, the term hypervisor is the essentially the software that lets us emulate hardware. And if you can emulate hardware, you can also store software on that emulated hardware. That's the idea of virtualization. Um, that term hypervisor has been around since the 1970s. The idea of even mainframes dividing up processing time and doing shared computing was a form of virtualization. So this is not a new concept, but VMware, they expanded on this idea and the and the, the thing that they did that really pushed the envelope on all this was that, hey, you don't necessarily need four different servers. And here's the other thing, here's the other crazy thing. If you wanted redundancy for those four servers, you'd really need eight servers, right? You could do clustering those together. So you'd have eight servers to provide redundancy for those. But with, with uh, virtualization, I can set up a hypervisor server, one server, and, and, and virtualize those other servers. Now, in the Microsoft world, we call that Hyper-V. That is the, the software that does this, Hyper-V, hyper, Hypervisor. Uh, Microsoft's not the one that came up with that. VMware's not the first to ever come up with that. VMware was the biggest contributor to this concept, though, so I do have to give them credit where credit is due. All right, now the other beautiful thing, though, about this is you get a really, really powerful machine. You virtualize your um, machines on those. You get these things called um, checkpoints in Microsoft. They used to be called snapshots, and a lot of other companies still call them snapshots, where you can make changes without the worry of breaking anything because you can revert back to before the change was made. The other thing that's wonderful about um, using virtualization is if I want to com uh, have complete redundancy, I don't have to have eight servers. I could literally you know, purchase another server and have a copy of the virtual machines on that other server. Now I've only got two servers as opposed to having to have uh, a total of eight servers. Okay, so this is a very powerful feature capability that kind of uh, started everything. Another thing that we got, and, and this is kind of where you start thinking about cloud computing, is with virtualization comes the, the term elasticity, which basically means that each of these machines can be given a certain amount of RAM processing power. But here's what's interesting about that. If one of the servers isn't using all of the available RAM that it's been given, it can share it with other servers. So for example, this file server has been given more RAM than it needs and then SQL needs that RAM, the file server can give up some of that RAM over to SQL. And when SQL's done using that extra memory, it can release it back to everybody 
it's basically a pool type scenario where it gets released into a pool of RAM and pool of CPU and they can grow and shrink as they need and that's the, the, the small way of sort of uh, on-premise way of looking at elasticity of course when you get into cloud computing you'll learn that that can expand across multiple machines across the you know the, the board in these big data centers but not to get into that just yet here but that's the idea hopefully that now helps you with understanding that concept of what virtualization is and with that is really where you know cloud computing started to come into play which I'm not explaining in this video but hopefully now you have a much better understanding of the concept of, of the RAS VPN as well the DMZ uh, concepts and virtualization and now we'll in this next section we'll start getting into the concept of cloud services now with the creation of virtualization this got companies thinking hmm if we can emulate hardware we can create this uh, these virtual machines and we can store software on that we can have operating systems running on that emulated hardware the operating systems being called guest operating systems we could technically host these virtual machines for companies for a price as a service so the idea being you know hey you pay us uh, a fee each month and we'll host your virtual servers and you don't have to deal with all the headaches of you know hosting your own data center on premise and the power that's needed to do that and the air conditioning that's needed to do that all the hardware that's needed to do that as well as the knowledge of how all the hardware works so this is essentially what a cloud company brings to the table so various companies like Google and IBM and Microsoft and Apple and, and all these these companies a lot of them already had uh, tons of data centers these big massive warehouses all over the world that they could support it. Some of these companies, such as Microsoft and IBM and uh, uh, Amazon, and Amazon being one of the, the biggest and first, uh, decided to open this up to the public for a fee and allow you to host um, your services in their data centers. So this is where cloud computing really comes into place. So this, this big cloud here is going to represent uh, cloud computing mainly the Microsoft cloud computing and of course it's all connected to the internet with incredibly fast high-speed internet connections fiber connections and all of that um, so there's some terminology or some acronyms I want to talk a little bit about real fast here as we get into this um, first off in cloud computing there is an acronym we call IAAS that stands for infrastructure as a service okay infrastructure as a service means that a provider is is hosting all of the hardware infrastructure for you and then they are going to provide you with a way for you to interact with that hardware and utilize their hardware as a service all right um, and this of course is where Azure comes into play Microsoft Azure now you might pronounce that word different people have different ways of saying Azure some people call it Azure some people call it Azure some people call it uh, I've even heard it called Azure before uh, Azure <laughs> there's various names for it. in fact uh, years ago when I was first learning Azure I decided I wanted to make sure I was, I was pronouncing this correctly so I was like I'm gonna go to watch the developers so I started watching videos of the the developers the the people who created Azure and uh, I figured I would determine the very first video I ever watched the guy was pronouncing it the word Azure so that's how I say it but what I further learned is that um, the Microsoft developers don't agree on how to say it either uh, some of them say Azure some of them call it Azure uh, some of them call it Azure so anyway tomato tomato pronounce it however you want to pronounce it okay but Azure is Microsoft's main IAAS system what this is is Microsoft is going to host they've got all these uh, data centers all over the world and they're gonna host their hardware so that you can host on top of their hardware your virtual machines or whatever it is so you can host virtual machines Microsoft will also allow uh, you to have access to what are called virtual appliances like uh, virtual firewalls uh, also virtual load balancing software because you can get um, you get access to what are called VNets 
This is virtual networking, so you can create these virtual networks based on TCP IP that are running your, you know, in their cloud service with virtual machines on it, and then you can put a virtual firewall. So you can almost like recreate what you're seeing here in an on-premise environment. You can recreate that in the cloud. Um, they also provide uh, virtual storage, so you can store data and backup data out there. Um, they support uh, database hosting all of that that's all part of IAS now with IAS the the model for that for the most part is you pay for what you use so there's a, a, a an algorithm that looks at how much memory how much processing power how much storage that's being used and then you you get a fee each month for what you're using the good news is they do have a, a calculator that kinda helps you forecast this and um, you can even set uh, alarms to let you know if you're approaching a certain budget that you've got on calls. There's a lot of things out there to help you do that. But that's the idea. You pay for what you use. Okay, now there is another couple of terms I want to mention as well. This next term is called platform as a service. And then there's a third term called software as a service. So platform as a service, uh, P-A-A-S, and software as a service, platform as a service, uh, and software. Well, let me explain software as a service first because that'll be it's pretty easy to visualize and then I'll explain platform as a service. So the idea of software as a service is uh, basically they have applications that can be hosted in the cloud service apps if you will. These apps are a hundred percent ready to use ready for you to take advantage of all you gotta do is use those applications okay for example Microsoft has what's called Office for the Web, or it used to be called Office Online. So that's like Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. You can run it from within your web browser. Uh, you, you know, all you got to do is just jump right in and, and use it. And so from an admin standpoint, all we have to do is you know assign the users that are allowed to, to use that, and they can go use it, and it's available to them 100%. All they got to do is start using it. There's not really a lot of administration for us now. What is platform as a service? Well, platform as a service is a system in which um, the majority of the, the configuration is done for us, but we still have some admin configuration we have to do to use it. For example, with, with virtual machines, this is 100% IAAS. A virtual machine is, it's a you can put whatever operating system on there, but you're responsible for the operating system. You're responsible for the software that goes on it. You as an admin have to manage all that. Okay. With platform as a service, virtual machines are set up in the background that you don't have any control over. They've already put the operating system on there. They've already put the software on there. You don't have any control over any of that, but there's still some administration you have to do uh, in order to control it. For example, um, Microsoft has a directory service called Azure AD. Now this is a big deal. This is probably one of the biggest deals of the things I've gone over so far in this cloud. Azure Active Directory is what we call a platform as a service. It is a directory service that is sort of the cloud version of what you have here called uh, uh, ADDS. So um, now I remember when I first heard about Azure a Active Directory I thought oh well this is just like you're just hosting virtual domain controllers in the cloud. No, they have completely redone the concepts of Active Directory. It is completely redone with all new web-based programming languages. It does not use any of the dated stuff like LDAP and Kerberos and all that. It uses industry standard authentication uh, protocols in order to support all the latest and greatest features and capabilities in the cloud. Okay, and so these are where users, passwords, all of that stuff is going to be managed in the cloud. But it starts out with almost nothing in it. So it's ready to use, but you as an admin have to start creating users and, and all of that. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, what if I want to use my on-premise users in the cloud? Well, stand by, I'll explain that in a second. Anyway, Azure AD is a platform as a service. So is, here's another one, Exchange Online. Microsoft has Exchange Online. That's a, that's a, a that is actually both a, a platform as a service and a software as a service in that um, the admin side of it is the platform as a service but the user side is the software as a service. Same thing for SharePoint Online. Microsoft has 
uh, SharePoint online as well. Same idea there. All right. And then you've got Microsoft Teams. That's a the the admin side of that is a platform as a service, but the user side of that is a software as a service. Um, there is uh, OneDrive for Business. That's a, a cloud storage that we have access to that uh, allows users to store their data out there in the cloud. There is a product called Intune, which is Microsoft's uh, MDM product. MDM, it's also MAM product, so it's, it's both. A mobile device management, that allows us to manage devices. This is one of the most powerful things we have uh, available to us. This is what sort of is, is replacing the concept of GPOs. This is going to allow us to manage our device settings. Not only can we manage on-premise devices, but we can manage mobile devices. GPOs can only manage devices for Windows. With Intune, we can manage Windows, Android, iOS, iPad OS, Mac OS, all that stuff. Um, with the help of Intune, we can manage the settings and restrictions. We can deploy software. This is a very, very powerful product okay, that we have available to us. Um, it even has a thing called Autopilot, which will allow us to reconfigure uh, Windows machines and all of that. So very, very powerful stuff that uh, we have available to us. All right. Um, now, I will tell you that Azure has... Um, Azure definitely has some of the, uh, you know, it has some platform as a service technologies and some software as a services technologies. But the the main um, the main type of system that Microsoft has created for platform as a service and software as a service is called Microsoft 365. Okay, Microsoft 365. All right which I forgot to add to my display here. We actually do have apps that are called the Microsoft 365 apps. All right. Which formally they would call them Office 365 apps. They're now, you know, starting to call them Microsoft 365 apps, but the Microsoft 365 services is it's it is a a cloud service that basically sits on top of Azure. So you've Azure in the, the, the background of all this and the Microsoft 365 sitting on top of it. All right. You can't have a Microsoft 365 um, account or tenant that doesn't also have Azure. Azure is um, in the background no matter what. And the other thing to be aware of is both of these share Azure AD. So that you'll notice that you, you there are web portals for creating users and things through Microsoft 365 or creating users through Azure. It all ties back to Azure AD. You're going to see the same users no matter what. So these two things are glued together, basically. Okay, they're glued together. Now, on Microsoft 365 with PaaS and SaaS and all that, you're not really going to be hosting virtual machines, but you're going to, you're going to be working with um, these services. Let's just kind of color code some of this real quick. All right. Now again, I do want to add that Azure does have PaaS and SaaS services that I'm not getting into right now, but it's mainly an IaaS-based service. That's that's its main focus. Microsoft 365 uh, is strictly PaaS-related and, and software as a service, SaaS-related. It doesn't really have any virtual machines or any of that, though it can interact with them. Okay, um, so if I was to sort of draw a circle around some of these. All of this stuff you see here would be, this would be uh, Azure related. And then all of this stuff you see right here would be the Microsoft 365 related. Now, um, they both share Azure AD. So I'm going to put a pur purple circle around that. Red and blue make purple. <laughs> all right. Um, and so they, they all link to that. Okay, and so that is how uh, Microsoft handles that those concepts. The other thing about 
Azure is with Azure, you're paying for the CPU, RAM, storage you use. With Microsoft 365, it's all based on licenses. So you, you purchase these subscriptions that have a certain amount of licenses, and you issue these licenses out to your users, and your users can take advantage of these various features. Okay. One more thing I want to explain here, and that is what about the issue of what if we want to uh, use our on-premise users to access resources in Azure? Well, Microsoft has a solution for that. They actually have a type of server that you can set up, and the server is called an Azure AD Connect server. Azure AD Connect. Now, what does this do? An Azure AD Connect server, this is a synchronization-based system, and what it will do is it will allow uh, my on-premise users to be synchronized out to Azure AD. Now, it does not allow Azure AD users to be synced in, only out, but it will allow user passwords and all of that uh, to be synced in. So if a user is uh, if a user is logging on to Azure AD and they change their password out in the cloud, it'll it can it does have the ability to synchronize that password back in. But the beauty of this is is by going this route, if you have this on-premise environment, um, you can achieve what we call SSO. What is SSO? Single sign-on. The idea of single sign-on with all of this is my user can sit down at their on-premise computer, they can log on, and it's going to log them on both in the cloud as well, as, or sorry, it's going to log them on on-premise as well as in the cloud at the same time. All right? and uh, they can access resources out there. The other thing I'll tell you is that Microsoft has moved into a way to where you could actually, you could technically not even have a domain nowadays. You don't necessarily have to have a domain. In fact, it, it pains me to say this as a consultant because, you know, I have fed my family for, you know, two decades by uh, using Active Directory, both teaching it as well as, um, you know, consulting on it. But I'll be honest, Microsoft is now moving in a direction to where domains are not even needed anymore. Um, they're now making it possible to where everything can be managed through your cloud service and domains are not needed. But if, if you're a company that's already got a domain and all this is still in place and all of that, then this Azure AD Connect server is going to be the thing that's going to help you. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully this has now uh, helped you have a better understanding. This was really just a fundamentals video um, to help you understand the cloud service, the concepts of it. And I hope that this has been helpful to you. Now, before we get started here, I would like to advise you, if you haven't watched the foundation videos where I drew this diagram out, you should probably do that because it's going to kind of help put it, everything into perspective as we move into what this is. So this video is about what is cloud computing. So what exactly is it uh, if you didn't know? Well, the first thing you got to do is look at things based on the way things have been for decades. All right. For decades, administrators have always managed everything on premise. So if you look in this this triangle that I have here, this domain environment that I've had here, of course, we didn't start using the triangle until about the year 2000 in the Microsoft world when Active Directory came out. But even before that, we had a lot of these same concepts, which, which was we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to host our own equipment our own, at our own facility. This meant that administrators would go out and they would have to purchase all these different servers uh, to be used in that environment. So you had servers for email, you had servers for databases, you had servers for things like VPNs, you had file servers, uh, you know, SharePoint came along in the Microsoft world, lots and lots and lots of servers. We had domain controllers for managing domains. So we had a lot of infrastructure. And not only that, speaking of infrastructure, we had network infrastructure as well. We had to deal with the, the network switches and the network routers, and we had cabling and Wi-Fi and all these different variables that came into the mix. And companies would spend thousands of thousands to tens of thousands to sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending upon the size of the company, in a year's time with the upkeep of all this. It also meant that admins, that the IT people, had to be trained 
on how to run all this stuff. So not only were we dealing with you know having to manage the software and the users and all of that, we also had to understand all of the hardware. And of course that that comes with a lot of headaches. All right, having to to manage the hardware and the software side of things. All right. So with the creation of virtualization, which virtualization began began getting very popular in the early 2000s. The the world realized that, you know, hey, we could we can um, basically do this as a service. So this terminology known as as a service came along where companies can basically manage equipment themselves and provide the hardware as a service so that IT people don't have to deal with that. So instead of me having to manage all of this equipment myself, having to deal with the, the power supplies, the backup generators, having to make sure we had air conditioning so the equipment got cool, somebody else can do it for me. And I can pay a fee to get access to utilize their equipment and host things out in the cloud. Now the other thing that comes with that is this concept of elasticity, which meant that let's say we were a web service company and we were hosting uh, uh, some kind of website and that website got very, very popular very, very quick. We might not have enough servers to accommodate the load we've got. We'd have to go out and buy new equipment. But with the creation of cloud services, they're gonna host all of that for us. They're gonna host virtual machines, they're going to host these different services out there in the cloud, and they can scale them very, very quickly. Now, we'll pay more of a monthly fee when that occurs, but ultimately, they are managing the, uh, the they're having to deal with all the hardware and the, the battery backups and the generators and the air conditioning and all that. We don't have to. As long as we admins have an easy way to get in and manage stuff that's being uh, out, that's being handled out in the cloud, our life is a lot easier. And what ends up happening is when you take away that cost of having to manage all this equipment, you know, all the hardware and the man hours and stuff that's put into to learning all of that and managing all that and all the headaches that's involved. And again, the power, the air conditioning, the, the space that's taken up in a building for it, it ends up being very, very cost effective to do things through the cloud. And I know that everybody has this worry. I know for me, I had this big worry when cloud computing first came out, that it was just going to take everybody's jobs. But in most cases, I really haven't seen that become a problem because the software side comes with its own challenges and learning the cloud comes with its own challenges. So you still need IT people to learn all of this stuff and manage all of this stuff. So I haven't really seen massive amounts of layoffs in IT due to, to this sort of concern. Now, don't get me wrong, I've heard a few stories where this has occurred, but in most cases, I haven't. In fact, as a consultant, I haven't really seen a lot of that going on. But the idea of cloud services is to host these services somewhere else, in somebody else's data center, so that an on-premise company does not have to manage it and all the headaches of dealing with all the hardware and all the, the stuff that goes with that, the, the air conditioning and the battery backups and the power and all the network equipment, you don't have to deal with that anymore. Don't get me wrong, if you're still dealing with the brick and mortar building and all that with, with people in it, with desktop computers and all that, yes, you're still gonna have to have some of that infrastructure, but you're not gonna have to have all the servers. You're not gonna have all the headaches that are involved there with all that. It's all gonna be managed out there in the cloud. So this is the idea. You're gonna let somebody like Microsoft manage all of this these services out there for you. All right, and I'm not really getting into the depth of, of uh, these three terms here, IAAS, PAAS, and SAAS, but that's all part of this hosting things as a service that is a huge part of cloud computing and another big part of it is the elasticity of it meaning they can rapidly grow very quickly or shrink things very quickly based on our needs whereas if we go out there and we buy a bunch of equipment that you know maybe we maybe the holiday season's very very you know big time for us as a e-commerce company or something and then we have to buy all these servers just to get through the holiday season and then when the holiday season's over you got a bunch of servers that are just sitting there you're not dealing with that sort of thing in cloud computing in cloud computing all of the 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 scalability and and elasticity and all that is managed by the cloud company itself
Now let's take a look at what Microsoft's official documentation says about the shared responsibility model here and I'm going to help you understand what's going on. So if you look, Microsoft says that the division of responsibility says in an on-premise data center you own the whole stack. In other words, you manage everything. When they say whole stack, they're talking about the ground up, the, the network infrastructure, all the cabling, all the servers, all the client machines, everything. Uh, all the services that sit on those servers, software, patching, everything is handled by us. So as you move to the cloud, some responsibilities transfer to Microsoft. And this diagram is going to kind of illustrate what they're saying here. So if you start from the beginning here, from an on-premise standpoint, all right, you'll see it's 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 us. Uh, it basically is uh, colored in with so, uh, darker blue here, which indicates that this is something that we would manage ourselves. Everything is our responsibility when you think about on-premise side. Okay. Now, when you start using cloud services and you move to that first level of IaaS, which is infrastructure as a service then certain responsibilities are going to be handled by us and certain responsibilities are going to be managed by the cloud provider in this case Microsoft right and Microsoft is as you can see here they are managing these first three blocks here which means they're going to manage the data center they're going to manage the network equipment and all the headaches that go with that and then they're all they're also going to deal with the physical host that are inside their data center. So they're talking about when they say physical host, they're talking about the servers that are going to manage everything virtually. Okay. So you are when you go and you host virtual machines and manage virtual machines and all that, that's is sitting on their physical equipment. Okay. And so that's what you're paying for. You're just basically paying for them to manage the hardware and then you will handle what's above that. So what is above that? Well, in this case being if you move to this next level, you're talking about the operating system, the network controls, applications, all of that. So you can see here with infrastructure as a service uh, that we would be responsible for dealing with the operating system. So, for example, if I'm hosting a, a virtual server that's running Windows Server on their, uh, their infrastructure, I'm managing the server's operating system. I've got to keep it updated. I've got to keep it patched. I've got to install whatever software on it I've got I've got to deal with. If there's any network configuration that needs to happen on that server, I'm responsible for that. Okay, now granted, I am responsible for that, right? It is going to sit on their network. And as long as I configure things properly based on their network configuration, the way that uh, that Microsoft's network is laid out, on what's called the uh, the Azure Virtual Network or VNet system, then it's going to work. But I am going to be responsible for configuring the uh, IP settings. Now, granted, I'll also tell you that on the Microsoft Azure Network, they do have a DHCP service that'll handle that. But you know, I'm not going to get into all that here. Okay. But I am going to be responsible for for all of that stuff. Now, um, I'm responsible for dealing with the operating system, the network controls, the applications. Uh, uh, identity, all of that, I got to manage accounts and identities, devices. So if I'm just using their network infrastructure and I'm not using any of the other services that they provide, then I'm responsibility. Uh, my responsibility is for all of this stuff you see here. Okay. All right. Now, if we move into the PAAS side of things, then this is where you start dealing with what's called platform as a service. And granted, I, I'm not thoroughly going over platform as a service and software as a service in this video. I'm trying to help you understand responsibility, your shared responsibility. But so there's more on that sort of thing uh, as we move along here. All right. But anyway, when you move to platform as a service, they they are now going to manage the operating system as well. So not only are they managing all the equipment, all the headaches that go with that, they're going to manage the operating system. And then I would be responsible for partially configuring some of the network settings so that it the uh, it works properly with what I want. For example, if I'm going to host a web application, they might host the uh, operating system. Uh, I might be responsible for putting the uh, the software on it. So, for example, maybe I'm going to host a website through Apache Web Service. I might be responsible for configuring the Apache Web Service on their uh, their operating system. I, they'll handle the operating system. I've got to configure the software that's on it. All right. I have to configure the network controls of it as well, maybe with a public IP address so it's accessible from the internet. And then uh, and then also 
identity and directory infrastructure that's partially managed by me, partially managed by them. For example, they have Azure Active Directory, which they host for us, but we still have to configure it. That's why it is shared responsibility. So that's what you're seeing here. When you see this right here, this symbol here is letting you know these are shared. These are things that we share. Now, with Platform as a Service, I'm still going to deal with the, I have to create all the accounts and manage the identities. I have to manage the devices that are involved there and also keep up with the information and data that's going to sit on them. Okay. All right. So then when we move into software as a service where they're basically just hosting the applications for us, like for example, if they're hosting all of the Microsoft 365, Office 365 uh, apps like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all that's hosted for us online, uh, I don't have to deal with any of this stuff with any of this stuff below here, right? Now I am gonna still have to deal with uh, what's called Azure Active Directory, which is where our credentials are. Um, they're still gonna provide that service to us, but we have to, to manage the accounts and everything that's in it, right? I have to manage what devices are gonna go to it, and I still have to manage my, my information and data. So ultimately, what you look at there with shared responsibility, depending upon which, which service you're going with in the cloud, whether it be uh, IAAS, PAAS, or SAAS, there's different responsibilities expected from both sides. And there's also different expenses that are going to be involved from both sides, which I'm not getting into the cost of it all in this video, but um, that's that's really what you have to consider. So I think this little diagram, I wanted to show this little diagram to you. Again, it is their official, it is an official diagram from their site you can visit if you want. But I, I did want to show you this official diagram because obviously this is where they take their, this is what they focus their information on. All right. And uh, it helps you understand whose responsibilities is what. Now, of course, this is not getting into a deep dive of shared responsibility. To understand that, you kind of have to understand each of the different topics, which, you know, we'll talk about a lot of that later. So stay tuned for that. But that should, this hopefully now gives you a much better understanding of what the shared responsibility model is all about in the Microsoft Azure and Microsoft 365 services. So let's talk now about the concepts of what a public cloud is versus a private cloud, a hybrid cl cloud, and then get into sort of the the uh, the details as to what the differences are. So the first thing to understand uh, about a public cloud is that uh, a public cloud is open to the public. It's available to anyone. Uh, anybody who wants to sign up for it um, can utilize it. Okay, and uh, the one of the you know, some of the benefits to this would be things like, you know, there is no, um, no money involved in dealing with on-premise servers. You can, you can utilize a public cloud and it's not going to cost you any, any money to, you're not going to have to have any servers on-premise for dealing with a public cloud, okay? Um... Now, there, uh, there's also with the idea of a public cloud, the other thing is, is scaling. With public clouds, applications can be quickly scaled up and down as needed because public clouds have lots and lots of infrastructure. We're not having to, to pay any money for that infrastructure they uh, they are hosting that infrastructure. When I say we're not having to pay for any money any money for that, what I'm trying to say is we're not having to pay for any on-premise equipment. That's that's key. Of course, you know we are paying to use their cloud service, right? All right. So there is that, right? Um, and then of course, speaking of pay, you pay for what you use. That's one of the biggest benefits of a public cloud. You only pay for what you use, right? Um, you're not paying for uh, services that you don't need, right? So if I'm going to host some virtual machines out there, uh, I, I can choose sort of like what monthly payment I'm looking at uh, and kind of limit what where I want to be with all of that. And I can I can sort of budget all of that and plan it all out. And if, if I need more uh, usage, I can allow elasticity. I can allow it to scale up, meaning give me more processing power, give me more RAM if I need it. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, so of course there is uh, one downside, obviously, of a public cloud is that uh, companies don't have complete 
control of the resources and security. So of course we don't have complete control over all the hardware and everything that, that's managed there. The cloud company does, okay? So that's a consideration That's that you could see that as a disadvantage. All right, let's talk about private clouds. Now the idea of a private cloud is uh, with private cloud, you are essentially paying for all the hardware and all the, the management of it. So with this, with a private cloud, um, probably one of the biggest benefits is companies have complete control uh, of the resources and security. So whereas a public cloud, that's seen as a, a big disadvantage with private clouds, you the company itself would have complete control over the resources and security, okay? Um, the next fact would be your, when you think about data, um, data is not stored on the same uh, equipment as other companies. So equipment is being basically dedicated to this company. As, a, as their private cloud and there's no data that's sitting on, the data is not sitting on any of the same equipment, any same storage equipment or anything like that that any other company is, uh, is storing um, their, their uh, data on, okay? So that's seen as obviously an upside to this concept of private cloud. Of course, that's where things get more expensive because you're paying for all the hardware and all of that, all right? So that brings us to our next little fact here. Hardware must be paid for and handled by the company that uses it. So a company would end up having to, to spend money to reserve dedicated hardware and keep that dedicated hardware. Uh, whereas with public cloud, uh, you're not dealing with any of that, right? Um, the company that's providing the service is handling everything, okay, as far as the management of that that service. Now, in the end, we can also argue that you, there's always money involved. You're always, even when you pay for what you're used, they're, they're rolling in some prices there. So there is that. Um, so that also kind of plays upon this last little fact I want to mention there, um, which is uh, the companies and vendors share upkeep cost of equipment. So when I say upkeep cost, you might use a private cloud vendor and you're paying for this equipment that's in their data center. You could even purchase equipment that's placed in their data center. It could be 100% yours where your company is uh, is paying 100% for it, but they are supplying the people to manage the equipment, to, to um, handle the equipment for you in their data center. Um, so they have to, they'll have to pay for the employees that are managing the equipment and the um, equipment that your equipment is sitting on. So if your equipment is on, uh, you know, server racks and all that, they're dealing with all the costs that's involved there. So that's why it says companies and vendors share upkeep uh, cost of equipment. All right. So then that brings us to hybrid. And hybrid is essentially where you can utilize both. And a lot of your cloud providers out there are providing this hybrid solution, meaning um, they're not just dedicated to public, they're not just dedicated to private. In fact, most cloud providers out there are hybrid, such as Microsoft. Right, uh, there are companies out there that that just do private, and there are companies out there that do just just do public. But most of them support hybrid. Hybrid means we have both. So the big biggest benefit is very flexible solution. It means that people can choose which solution they want to go with. Right, they can they can do a mix. They can do one. They can do the other. I could go full on public. I could go full on private. Um, or I can do a mix. Okay, so maybe for certain circumstances, maybe I need to go with the more private side of things, and in certain circumstances, I can go public because it's going to be a cheaper solution. Okay, so that is the idea there. 
Okay, so companies get to determine uh, what is private and public. All right, so that's obviously a benefit, right? And then uh, lastly, with that, is the security and compliance and legal requirements and all of that that's involved there. Um, because companies get to choose, they do have to consider compliance and or legal requirements. Okay. So because companies get to choose, they do have to consider compliance and, le and or legal requirements. So what am I saying there? Well, what that essentially means is, is that if you are going to go with a public cloud, there might be, depending upon what, you know, uh, workplace market you're in, what kind of, maybe you're a, like, for example, you might be a government contractor uh, company that does work with the government. Well, you might have to go full all private because of that, all right? Uh, or maybe you're involved in some law firms and the, and, and the law firm is dealing with, uh, and you have a law firm that's dealing with some governmental resources and some uh, public resources. And so you, you'd have to keep certain things private on the private cloud and certain things on the public cloud. And it'd be great to say, well, we'll just go full all private, but private is more expensive. So this is why it's important for companies to be able to choose between public versus private. All right. But yes, uh, the security side of things, the compliance and legal restrictions, those are requirements, are things that have to be considered there. All right. So these are just some of the, the considerations that you want to be thinking about in regards to a public cloud, private cloud versus hi a hybrid cloud. And hopefully this little drawing uh, table that I've created here for you gives you a, a much better understanding of some of the ups and downs of going with which type of cloud. Let's talk now about the concept of consumption-based models involving the Microsoft Cloud Services. So what is the consumption-based model? Well, it's a real simple idea. It's basically pay-as-you-go. There's no upfront cost whatsoever, okay? You can set your services up and essentially you will get to choose what level of services you want. For example, if I want a virtual machine that has eight core processor with uh, X amount of gigs of, of memory and X amount of, of terabytes of storage, I can totally do that if I want, all right? I can uh, expand this pretty, pretty much as high as I wanna go or as low as I wanna go for the most part, as long as, of course, uh, on the low side, I can manage, uh, the services can manage what it is I want. For example, you're not gonna you know, host a SQL server with only uh, 128 megs of RAM, <laughs> right? You're going to need, you're, you're generally going to need more if you're scaling out. So you, you do have to consider the, the load you're, you're going to host. But the beauty of that is, is when you're picking out these services, you're going to get to choose. It'll show you the average monthly cost based on the average uh, uh, CPU, memory, and storage network usage. And then from there, you uh, you will get you'll pay that fee based on that. So there's no need to purchase and manage costly infrastructure that users might not use to their fullest potential. And also, you basically have the ability to expand. I can say, hey, I need more resources, or hey, I need less, okay? Uh, you know, I've had, I've had situations as a consultant like that where a company, you know, they, they, they chose too high of services and they were paying too much a month and they weren't using all the services they were paying for, so the, we were able to scale back if we need to. Okay, so you can get rid of services you no longer need. You can add services that you do want uh, to, to add in this regard. This is the beautiful thing about the consumption-based model. Now, the traditional management strategies that we've used in the past, especially when we think about things on-premise, there is, there's issues there. Um, for one, we have to estimate what we're going to need. Again, if we are some kind of e-commerce company and we say, okay, well, we estimate we're going to need three servers to handle the amount of load that, we, that we're going to have for our web service. Well, then all of a sudden the holiday season comes along and maybe you're selling a lot more products than you normally do. And then all of a sudden you realize three servers is not going to be enough. So you buy five servers. Or maybe you go ahead and buy five servers ahead of time, right? And... Uh, in traditional management of all this, you would have those five servers just sitting there. Maybe you're only using 
the the three servers capacities most of the time and only time you're going to need the five servers is during the holiday season so you run into that type of thing okay um so you have to think about the 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 common ways that people have done this in the past with with uh you know if you've got consistently high amounts of utilization and you know what that's going to be all the time then you're okay but very few companies can can guarantee they're always going to have a certain consistent utilization you, what you're going to find is things are going to go up things are going to go down throughout the day but not only that throughout the days throughout the weeks throughout the months of the year based on what's going on all right and this last thing i want to look at with you is just looking at the concept of a fixed static versus a consumption based or elastic scenario okay so if you look at this little model here you can see it's showing that during certain times of the day, you're looking at an 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. time period here. You can see that during certain times of the day, if this was like a service that were, that's being provided, that um, that it scales out at a certain time. There's a lot of load between the, the hours of 8 and 10 o'clock, right? And then maybe it kind of goes down. And then during the lunch hour, it goes way down. And then it jumps back up around 1 o'clock, 2 p.m., and then it kind of averages itself out till about 6 p.m. when everybody leaves. This would be like maybe if you're thinking about like a database servers and things like that that people are using at the office. This is a good example of that. Now, if you purchase equipment that's dedicated and it's not being hosted in the cloud, in other words, it's just called fixed or static, then um, you'll see uh, the the orange line that goes there is just a straight line. Basically, you've you you've got all of this that you've paid for, but you're not even using all of this. Uh, consumption during certain time periods so it's just really just a waste of a uh, consumption during that during this time so if I go out and buy a bunch of equipment and I'm hosting it on premise and that equipment is now mine and it's dedicated uh, 24 hours a day seven days a week uh, and you know if I didn't buy enough equipment I might have to buy more okay or if I bought too much equipment now it's just sitting there and not being used this is the thing you get into with fix and static so again this whole consumption model idea is sort of pay as you go. You only pay for what you need when you need it, as opposed to um, you know paying for a certain amount of equipment like in an on-premise environment that maybe just sits there and isn't being used. Now, if you go to Google or Bing and do a search on cloud services pricing, there is an article that Microsoft puts out on how they handle the pricing of a lot of their different services that will help you get a better understanding of this. So I'm going to go to this little article right here, and uh, I want to look at a couple things. All right. So the first thing to understand when it comes to cloud pricing, pricing is the region of the world where this service is going to be managed in a Microsoft data center will affect the price. So in this case, I'm looking at central U.S., but you could drop this down and select the region that, uh, that it's looking at. The next thing would be the currency. So you can select the currency, and then you can also look whether or not you're looking at this from an hourly perspective or a monthly perspective. Okay. A lot of things you do in Azure is going to be uh, analyzed either hourly or monthly, but a lot of people, when they're working from a, from a financial standpoint, they're usually working off of like a monthly budget. So a lot of people like to go with monthly, okay, when they look at this. But from here, we're looking at some of the, the services being hosted in the cloud involving virtual machines and all that. And you can see they have what's known as an instance. Uh, this is a an instance of a virtual machine for example that's being hosted and they're telling you how many cores how much memory and then they got what's called temporary storage uh, that's going to be hosted there for you temporary storage is going to involve uh, what is known as virtual memory that's stored on a uh, temporary hard drive for that machine okay not going to get into the the extreme depth on this because really really just looking at cost here um, but as you can see pay as you go this is 1460 a month for this 5840 a month and as you go up, you're seeing getting more cores, get more RAM, more temporary storage. Here's even more cores. So you can see this is the average. So if you were to keep this, if this was a virtual machine, and you were to keep it up and running 24-7, it never shuts down, then, then this is what you're going to average a month. Okay. Now keep in mind, you can schedule virtual machines to shut down at certain times and come back up at certain times if you want. Uh, maybe you could even have virtual machines shut down during the weekend. There's ways of, of kind of limiting the, the cost here. So if we go down, here's some other uh, uh, instances that you can go with. 
All right, but really what I want to show you is we move down here to uh, some of these other examples where you start getting into like solid state drives and, uh, and all of that with your virtual machines. You can do pay as you go, but you also have an option where if you already have got a feel for what type of virtual machines you're going to need to do your job, you can do, you can pay a reserve fee, okay? This is also sometimes referred to as an enterprise agreement with Microsoft. So, for example, let's say that this year uh, we did this uh, D1 instance. Then again, I always recommend that you start out as just pay as you go because you don't really know what you need. But then as a year goes by or a few months goes by, you determine, okay, this is this is exactly what I need. Okay, this, this $102 a month is going to work for us. So what I could do in the, maybe the following year, the months go by, after maybe doing this for a few months, I could say, let's go ahead and reserve this for a whole year and look at the savings. Or if I do three years, look at the savings. So it ends up you, uh, you pay a, a cheaper rate if you reserve it for a year or three years. So this would be what's called an enterprise agreement with Microsoft as opposed to just pay as you go. Okay, so when you think about and comparing the different pricing, these are some of the things you think about. You have to look at the region, think about the currency, obviously, and then whether or not you're looking at this from an hour or monthly standpoint, and then you will um, you will look at the instance. Now, something else that uh, I, you'll you'll probably hear me referring to is that Microsoft has what's called the pricing calculator, and this is the probably the biggest thing that is good for you to, to spend time in before you're utilizing things in Azure. I can just do a quick Google search on Azure Price Calculator, okay? Just put that into, into Google or Bing or something like that, and the Azure Pricing Calculator is right here, Pricing Calculator. You can go on here and you can very easily choose the things that you're, you're interested in, whether it's virtual machines or storage accounts, and you can look at the pricing based on that, okay? So again, if I want to look at virtual machines, I can click on that specifically. And then from there, I can click view and I can choose all this stuff here, these different instances, okay, and uh, and go from there. There's the one-year plan, three-year plan, all of that. You can see the discounts involved. So that is going to be the best way when you're really starting to plan out what Azure services you want and kind of getting a good comparison of the actual cost of those services. I now like to talk about the concepts of high availability as well as scalability. So let's start with high availability. Now, this is just a Wikipedia article. You can go out to Google Bing, do a search for high availability. You'll see a Wikipedia article. And the reason I like this article is because it has a nice little table that kind of breaks down the nine rating. But the idea of high availability is measuring the level of uptime of a particular service. So you got to imagine that in Azure, Microsoft is providing services uh, at a cost, which you would, you know, you would pay as you go, or you would pay for a certain amount of services for a year or three years or whatever, and you expect those services to be available during uptime. Now, pretty much, or during during the the time that your business is up and running, right? So whatever business hours you you set up, those that's what you're expecting, you know, uptime to be, you really want it to be 100%. Now, no company is going to give you a 100% service level agreement, which a service level agreement, almost also known as an SLA, is going to be the agreement between some type of service provider as well as the customer. You have SLAs with just about all sorts of things in your life. You have an SLA with your cellular provider. You got an SLA with your, uh, your power provider water utility company, gas company, you know, all the different uh, companies maybe that you do business with, you'll have a service level agreement because they are a service provider. And Azure is no difference, uh, different involving, you know, in regards to what Microsoft is trying to do with it. So um, the first thing to understand is that, you know, you're not going to get 100% SLA out of any company. Uh, you know, high availability is that measurement of that level of uptime, and they're going to tell you what that measurement of uptime is going to be based on their service level agreement. And most of the time, you're going to get a, a nine rating of somewhere between three nines, three and a half nines, or four nines. Now, it's kind of funny when you think about somebody uh, bragging about, oh, I'm up 99% of the time. Because if, if something is up 99% of the time, then that's a two nine rating. That means that 
uh, in a month, they could be down 7.3 hours a year, right? I'm sorry, a, a month. 7.3 hours a month. That's, you know, 21 hours a quarter. That's 3.65 days a year. That's 1.6 hours a week, 14 minutes of downtime a day. That would be bad in regards to most businesses. Now, a lot of the services in Azure, you're going to get at least a 3.9 a SLA. The thing you got to understand, and I'll show this to you in a minute, is you're not it's not a blanket SLA okay you don't get you don't get an SLA for for um, for that that's three nines for everything or three and a half nines for everything or four nines for everything there's even instances where you get 16 nines of SLA when it comes to storage uh, which this table doesn't even go beyond 16 nines it goes to, to nine nines here uh, so 2.63 milliseconds a month that was if you had nine nines that gets into storage which I'm I'm not really focused on too much here mostly at this point I'm sort of thinking in regards to virtual machines however what you really want to have in your head here is that there are various resources that Azure is going to provide and there's different SLA high availability ranges for those different services a 3.9 would give you 43 minutes of downtime a month. And, and the monthly downtime is really what you want to look at. Um, if, my, if Microsoft violates that downtime, they're supposed to give you Azure credits towards your next month. So uh, the downside of that is you kind of have to monitor that and report it yourself. Um, most cases, they're not just going to give you that credit unless it's like severe, then they'll automatically give it to you. But you, you can monitor it yourself, monitor downtime. Uh, in regards to something called Azure Monitor that they provide you with. So you get three nines usually with a lot of stuff, and you get three and a half nines with a lot of stuff. So that means downtime would be no more than 21.9 minutes a month. And then four nine with nines with a lot of services. You do have to, usually when you get in four nines, you are going to pay a little extra for that. But that's only 4.3 minutes of downtime a month on any service. Okay. So how can I tell? what agreement I'm going to get when it comes to uptime. If you go to Google and just do a search for Azure SLA, just do a quick Google search for that. They have a document you can pull up in regards to their SLA, and you can click on whatever service you're interested in looking up the service level agreement for. So, for example, if I'm willing to look at, at virtual machines or whatever, I would click on Compute, and then there is virtual machines, as well as a bunch of their other services here. So I can click on that, and this is where they kind of outline what you're getting, okay? So they're telling you here, for all virtual machines that have two or more instances deployed across two or more availability zones, you get four nines. Now, I'm not really talking about availability zones in this video, but in a nutshell, that involves having uh, uh, basically um, uh, replicas of your virtual machines in different uh, data centers, which, of course, is going to provide you with a higher level of SLA. Okay. They also tell you for virtual machines that have two or more instances deployed in the same availability set, um, this gets into having multiple virtual machines in the same data center, you're getting a three and a half nine SLA. Okay, and then they talk about having solid state storage, which can get a higher level of uptime than um, hard disk drive storage can, uh, things like that. So you can, it, the moral of the story here is that Whatever service you're interested in, whatever service you're working with in Azure, you can always go and you can check the service level agreements uh, about that particular resource and you can find out what the availability is. Now, the other thing we have to consider here is scalability. All right. Now, there's two forms of scalability. Scalability gets into the, the being able to expand when necessary. And there's two forms of a scalability. The first form of scalability is uh, called scaling up or vertical scaling. Vertical scaling is where you're going to go with a, a, maybe you start out with a lower level of processing power and you go to a higher level of processing power. And then horizontal scaling is where you're scaling out and having multiple instances of something like a virtual machine so instead of you know I might start out with one virtual machine but it can generate you know five more of those same virtual machines if it needed to to handle a certain amount of load like with web servers let me give you a couple of illustrations inside of Azure so if I go to portal.azure.com here that's going to take me to the initial uh, Azure environment itself just the dashboard itself so we'll go ahead and sign into that okay so let me put in my credentials here get signed in 
and then what we'll do is let's say we're going to create a virtual machine now again this is not the video where I'm demonstrating creation of virtual machines or anything like that I'm trying to help you understand availability here so if I go to the menu button though and I click on uh, uh, let's do virtual machines this blade called virtual machines all right and then if I click to create let's say I want to create an Azure virtual machine okay from there all right I would choose my region uh, I would set up a resource group choose my region give it a name but what I really want to point out is there is availability zones that's going to involve high availability okay not covering availability zones a whole lot in this video but this would involve uh, having multiple replicas of a virtual machine in multiple you know having data centers multiple data centers that have copies of your virtual machine if an entire data center got taken offline you'd have uh, another data center that had a copy of it okay so that's the idea in a nutshell of what a availability zone is okay there's also these things called availability sets which I'm not really covering right now either which involves having uh, redundancy across a single data center maybe multiple virtual machines across different equipment racks but what I really want to show you is down here if we're talking about vertical scaling you have a size right and um, I can start out with this seventy dollars a month virtual machine two virtual CPUs eight gigs of RAM but at any time you can scale up so I could go if 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 this was not gonna be enough for my uh, server if it wasn't enough performance I could scale up to this four virtual CPU 16 gigs of RAM at any time and it literally just takes like a couple of minutes for it to do that and there's no downtime for your virtual machine to scale up now I might scale up and then I might decide I'm gonna scale back to this uh, 8 gigs maybe I'm only scaling up for a particular time of year maybe it's gonna be the holiday season or something I could do that so that is called vertical scaling now there's also what is called horizontal scaling and this is done through something called a scale set this is a scaling out scenario with scale sets and again this is not the official scale set video I'm not getting into the depth on this but with scale sets the uh, Azure can generate multiple instances of your virtual machines okay so you might set up a web server and you can set rules for what's called auto scaling where when my virtual machine reaches a certain level of performance like maybe it's a web server it reaches a certain level of performance like 90 percent and it's averaging 90 percent for about 30 seconds I can say go ahead and let's generate another instance of that virtual machine so it'll bring the load down so it could generate a second instance and it can load balance the traffic so some of the traffic goes to the first virtual machine some of the traffic goes to the second one and then you could even say hey if both of those reach 90 percent and they're averaging 90 percent for 30 seconds of usage let's go ahead and generate another one and then generate another one so if you were dealing with a very intense time of year and you needed to scale out and have multiple virtual machines um, to handle that you could do that that is what we call uh, horizontal uh, horizontal um, uh, when when trying to basically generate this high level of performance okay so if I do uh, horizontal scaling where I'm scaling out to multiple virtual machines I can or I could do vertical scaling which is just getting higher level of performance okay so now hopefully that gives you a better understanding remember this video is not trying to show you how to set up virtual machines necessarily it's just to try to help you understand those two concepts the concepts of high availability also the concept of scalability I want to discuss a couple other pieces of uh, terminology with you here the first term being reliability and the second term being predictability so the idea of reliability uh, is very important when it comes to Azure services you could say that part of the, the big move move to the cloud for a lot of companies is to make things more reliable but another piece would be predictability which is to be able to predict when something may fail uh, and you know what's going to be our measure of downtime on that so reliability is is looking at the concept of if something is stable if you have stability with something if I've set up a bunch of virtual servers virtual machines and uh, what is my reliability factor on that of course the SLA the service level agreement gives you a, a good idea of that if they provide you with three and a half nines or four nine rating you can measure what the average uh, high availability 
is going to be. Now, most months, and this is just going by experience, there's no downtime whatsoever in the Azure environments, but you can't always bank on that. So you have to look at what their service level agreement is uh, in regards to that and just and be, be ready for that. But so so if we know there is there could be some downtime and maybe we can't you know we can't deal with that downtime we're trying to predict that okay well let's say our web server is down um let's say our web servers is, is down for uh an hour you know in a six month period what we'd have to do is we'd have to measure uh, you know what how much money we make on average off that web server and then it being down for an hour during a certain period what would be the measurement of loss on that right and that's hard to do at a company so uh, an easier way to look at it is that we need to try to make ourselves have a hundred percent uptime if we possibly can and one way we can do that is to put more redundancy in place which is going to give us a higher level of reliability and then as far as the predictability of something going down it's going to be a lot less likely all right so Microsoft does provide us with various ways to do that okay various things we can do now I'm in this video I'm kind of looking at this from the standpoint of virtual machines but um, they you know they have different reliability capabilities for redundancy um, in a lot of their various services it don't matter if you're talking about a virtual machine or if you're dealing with uh, the storage side of, of Azure if you're dealing with network redundancy whatever you know uh, service you're you have in your mind in regards to what Azure is providing they have reliability uh, capabilities that is going to provide us with redundancy okay so like in regards to a virtual machine if I go up here to this little menu button and I go and click on virtual machines and I go here to create a virtual machine and go right here I can say create an Azure virtual machine so first off one of the things that's going to give us reliability would be these uh, these availability options here we can make things more reliable by utilizing some of the capabilities that we have one being this thing called an availability zone okay uh, getting availability zones getting into making sure there are multiple instances of our virtual machines located in different data centers so what you'll find is Microsoft has uh, over there's like 60 something regions in the world and the reason I say 60 something is because they're adding new regions all the time and each region of the world Microsoft on average has three different zones a zone being a data center at that uh, in that region so most most regions like East US or East US 2, West US, West US 2, 3, these various regions, most of them have three different zones. Okay, that's three different data centers. So that's one level of redundancy to give you a higher reliability factor. And then another would be utilizing what is known as um, uh, availability sets. Availability sets is uh, a little less rely has less reliability and availability zones because availability sets is where you essentially are just having multiple equipment racks in a facility uh, that that way if you're talking about a single data center you have a copy of your virtual machine that is replicated amongst different pieces of equipment racks so if an equipment rack fails not just like the whole data center you're still okay now if the whole data center fails then you would still be at, uh, your virtual machine would no longer be up and running that's why an availability zone is a better way to go all right another option is to perform the ability of the reliability factor of of, uh, of scaling out and that's where you get into virtual machine uh, scale sets all right so this is this is an idea when you think about reliability availability has a direct effect on reliability and that's the thing to remember here okay now uh, another thing to be to be concerned about and this is getting into the predictability of it is the amount of load something may have on it and how much traffic can uh, you know one type of virtual machine handle versus another and I'm not getting into all the details on that I will say that or in this video at least you you can go to the Azure calculator and you can look at you can put plug numbers in of, of load like how many connections and things like that you've got on something you can see kinda how the loads gonna be affected by that but there are different um, things to consider with that for example 
if you decide, well, I'm going to have three web servers that I've set up, three virtual machines that I've set up that are going to manage this amount of load, you have different pieces of virtual equipment that assist you with that. For example, I can go here to um, the menu button, I can go to all services, and I can search for what is called load balancer. All right, and you can set up virtual appliances known as load balancers to assist with managing the load of traffic that's flowing in. Okay, this is a traditional load balancer appliance right here, and I could create that if I wanted to uh, inside of Azure. Now, again, this is not the load balancer video or anything I'm getting into. I just wanted to point out that this is something that does affect um, traffic flowing in if you're if you're trying to balance load between these different virtual machines so not only do you have to think about okay I've got reliability here but um, because I've got high availability with my my different servers maybe I got three three servers that are handling load I also have to consider um, the amount of, of load that a single virtual machine is going to handle I'm gonna need some kind of appliance that's going to distribute that load evenly and so this is what a load balancer would do for you my, so main thing I'm trying to get across to you here is there are various concepts that will be put into place. The interesting thing about all that is those are the same kinds of concepts that we had on premise that we'll have in the cloud, but instead of using physical equipment, you're now using these uh, Azure objects, which are virtual appliances that are going to help you achieve this. All right. So hopefully that gives you a, a, a little bit of better understanding of that terminology, these concepts of uh, supporting reliability and predictability. One of the major benefits of moving into cloud services is the centralization and management of security and governance for our cloud services. What that involves is the fact that uh, when you think about the on-premise side of things, your uh, security was uh, a lot of times, in a lot of cases, manually being managed by us in IT. There wasn't a lot of artificial intelligence capabilities in the on-premise world. Uh, it was strictly set up to us. We had to manually go through logs and research things. There wasn't a lot of automated services. Now, the cloud is the exact opposite. In the cloud services with things like Azure, we have a lot of automated tools and a lot of monitoring capabilities that are analyzing the people who are logging on, when they're logging on, it's monitoring their uh, their different um, activities they're performing. It's going to notice things like users that normally work between the hours of 9 a.m. 5 p.m. Maybe that's when they're active. It's going to notice if a user's logging on super duper early in the morning, like 4 o'clock in the morning, or if a user's logging on at like 10 o'clock at night. It's going to look at things like the IP addresses in which they're logging on from. Maybe, you know, one day they're logging on from Dallas, Texas, and the next day they're logging on from China. Uh, something suspicious on that. And then Azure can can send out alerts to admins. Azure can also challenge users. In other words, if, if you really are who you say you are, I'm going to activate multi-factor authentication. I'm going to send a text message to your phone and you got to put that code in. You know, things like that, that's going to really strengthen the defenses of your environment. In fact, I'll show you a little bit of that just to give you a, a little bit of a visual. Here I am on portal.azure.com. I'm going to click the menu button here. I'm going to go down to uh, Azure Active Directory. This, of course, is where all of our users and groups and uh, and all that are managed in the cloud. Now, if I go uh, down here, there's a there's a blade here called Security. If I click on that blade, uh, I've got this thing called Identity Protection right here. And uh, Identity Protection, I can go there, and um, I've got a couple of different policy sets that it's going to use. It's going to use this thing called Sign-in Risk Policy and User Risk Policy. So this lets me set a policy that uses artificial intelligence to determine whether or not a user is a, ri a risky user, a risky sign-in, a risky user. Again, it's going to analyze things like time of day. It's going to analyze IP addresses. It's going to analyze their activities. Uh, it's also um, where this uh, this service also works in conjunction with the Microsoft Security Team. Microsoft Security Team is monitoring the dark web for um, leakages of people's uh, passwords. So they uh, they have scans that they do to see if any if any of your users' email addresses and their passwords have shown up in the dark web um, password databases when when hackers 
you know, they steal people's passwords. A lot of times they end up in the dark web. It's going to find that information. And from there, a user can be flagged as like a low, medium or high risk user. And you can decide what to do if they are low, medium or high risk user. You could have a user just completely blocked if you want. You could um, trigger a user to have to put in multi-factor authentication where they have to, you know, get a a thing on their phone, a message on their phone, or some other, uh, you may be a, what's called the Microsoft Authenticator app. So this is what's going to go on there. And then from us, from an admin standpoint, we have the ability to look at log information on things like risk detections and all that. If it discovers any kind of user that maybe is at risk, risky sign-in users or risky uh, users in general. So it watches their activities. So that's just one facet of this. We, we also have, we come back over here, we have conditional access. And we can create policies with this and again this is not a video on conditional access this is helping you understand security and governance as a, as a from a sort of an overview but i can i can look at things like you know specific users i want to analyze or specific groups i want to analyze i can look at um things like uh, maybe the the operating system they're using maybe i want to have a policy that analyzes uh, android and ios users and mac os users maybe and um, I can have uh, a set of policies that decides what to do. Perhaps, you know, um, I'm going to require that, that you just get blocked if you violate some form of compliance. Um, so, so that's the other thing we have on this is you can set sets of policies that make your devices adhere to a level of compliance. For example, I could require that if you're using an Android device, you have to have a certain vo version of the Android operating system. Uh, same for iOS. Maybe you got an Apple iPhone and you have to have a certain uh, version of that. Um, if you got if your iPhone is too old or your operating system is too old, that violates compliance, and I can make where you can't authenticate and use any of the cloud services. So again. This really uh, puts things into perspective for us. We also have the ability to do what is called sensitivity labels, where we can have documents that get labeled things like classified, unclassified, top secret, secret. And um, I can make it where you can't open that document unless you adhere to a certain level of security. So this, and this goes across all the different surfaces. Not only is this in documents that are in the cloud, but if you're using things like Windows 10, Windows 11, whatever, these policies can actually be deployed down to a person's computer and they have to adhere to these rules even on their their own computers or even smartphones and tablets and all that. So this is an extremely powerful capability to have artificial intelligence machine learning features and allow us to deploy these policies no matter what platform you're on, whether it's a desktop, laptop, smartphone, tablet, whatever. All right. So the security and governance side of, of the Azure Microsoft 365 services is very, very powerful. It's definitely something to consider when you're thinking about moving into the cloud, just the fact that you're going to have all these uh, security capabilities at your disposal. So when it comes to management of your cloud services, there's a couple ways to look at it. Uh, number one would be um, management of the cloud. Number two would be management in the cloud. Management of the cloud involves being able to manage the different resources that I have available to me. So you're going to find that as, you, as you're adding different resources into Azure, each resource has different management capabilities that let you control those resources. Okay. Um, and then management in the cloud would be management in the cloud would be just the different um, portals and, and methods that I can use for managing your, your cloud service. Let's let's kind of just take a quick glimpse at the different things I'm talking about here. So um, when it comes to management of the cloud, you have different management areas for the different resources you're working with. For example, if I'm working, if I'm talking about Azure Active Directory, I'm going to go to the menu button here and I'm going to go down to Azure Active Directory and I have all these different blades and configuration options that are going to let me manage the different Azure Active Directory services. If I'm talking about virtual machines, I have another blade for virtual machines and this is where my virtual machines would be and I could click on one and I could manage the features and capabilities of that individual virtual machine. Same thing for things like SQL databases, uh, virtual networks, storage accounts, the various resources that you work with in Azure, you will have access to those resources for managing those resources. The other thing is monitoring those resources that you're managing. 
uh, Azure has what's called Azure Monitor, and Azure Monitor comes with a bunch of features and capabilities that'll let you monitor the different resources that you are configuring in Azure. Okay, so that involves management of the cloud, right? Management of the cloud resources. And then finally, again, management in the cloud. Well, managing management in the cloud involves the different ways we do this. So first we have the portal, right? Portal.azure.com. That is the normal everyday graphical way of managing your Azure resources. There is also something called Cloud Shell. Cloud Shell will allow me to manage my uh, Azure resources through a shell-based environment, which will involve command line. So I've got the ability to do what is known as PowerShell to manage the Azure resources using a command line known as PowerShell. And then I've also got what's called, um, what is known as Bash, um, also known as the Azure CLI, command line interface, which of course Bash is geared towards people that know Unix, Linux based systems. And then PowerShell is sort of what we've you know had in Microsoft now for uh, going on 15, 16 years. Well, I guess it's been, it's been 16, something like that years. Um, and you can use either of these command line options for managing these different services and you can switch back and forth. So right now it's, as you can see, it's defaulting to bash and I got a command line. And then if I click on PowerShell, I can switch over to the PowerShell way of managing it, whatever you feel more comfortable with. Okay. The other thing you can do is if you have PowerShell, um, uh, you can actually, with Windows 10, Windows 11, whatever you're using, you could pull up PowerShell and you can connect to the cloud from within PowerShell. You can also download what's known as the Azure CLI to your own computer and you can connect to um, Azure that way and manage it. Now, the last way that you can deal with management in the cloud would be what is known as uh, APIs, um, which is application programming interfaces. And that involves the fact that Microsoft has these uh, connectors, these API connectors that allow developers on the internet to create tools that can communicate with Azure. That means that third party companies, third party services can connect and communicate with Azure as well, which is very helpful if you're in a mixed environment. Uh, for example, maybe you are working with the Azure services, but you're also dealing with Amazon, which is AWS, the AWS cloud services, and you need to connect the two together and have them uh, running different services and activities. Well, the good news is they can because Microsoft has set up APIs, application programming interfaces, which are these little software connectors that allow things to connect and communicate and run commands and all that. So that is the management in the cloud side of things. So again, when it comes to management of Azure, there's management of the cloud, which involves managing all the different cloud services uh, itself. And then there's management in the cloud, which is the different methods in which we connect in into the cloud to do things. I want to spend a little time now and make sure that we're very clear on what IaaS is. Now, IaaS is Infrastructure as a Service, and the idea of Infrastructure as a Service is a cloud provider, such as Microsoft, is going to be uh, essentially hosting all of the hardware side of things for your organization. In other words, they're providing the data center. They're providing the equipment racks with the server blades and all the network equipment and all the power supplies uh, and, and all the air conditioning and all of the stuff involved there. And then the only thing we have to worry about would be managing whatever is going to be placed on those uh, pieces of equipment. So the pieces of equipment, the server blades and all that, they're, they're called host servers and these host servers can host virtualization for us so in that case we can go into a place like portal.azure.com right we can go down here and say okay i want to create a virtual machine click create specify i want to create an azure virtual machine and then from there we can specify the the name we want to give it the region whether or not we're going to utilize availability, in other words, if we're going to manage avail high availability with it, all right, and then we can even choose the operating system images we want to go with. Okay, maybe we want to use Windows Server 2022. All right, we have there's other images we can go with, or we could actually use Linux if we wanted to, and then we would choose our our size, and then that is that's going to specify 
how much power our virtual machines are going to have, right? So we can even see a monthly fee there. We can see all sizes, all right, that are available and how many virtual CPU cores we're going to get, how much RAM we're going to get, data disk, the maximum input outputs per second we're going to get, you know, as far as storage goes. We can actually go up to a much more powerful series of uh, virtual machines if we want. But ultimately, the idea there is they are hosting the, the virtual machines for us on their equipment, right? And the thing we'll be responsible for is the operating systems and the management, all that. In fact, let's jump back over to that shared responsibility model and uh, make sure we're clear on a few things. All right, so back here on the shared responsibility model, You'll notice that if you're talking about this IaaS, this infrastructure as a service, Microsoft is essentially going to be responsible for this stuff here. Okay, they're going to be responsible for the physical data center, their the physical network, the physical host. Now, what are we responsible for? Well, basically everything from this point up, right here, right. We're going to be responsible for managing the operating system. They'll give us an image with server or Linux or whatever on it, but we're going to have to deal with making sure it's updated, making sure that it's configured a certain way. We'll have to make sure that we have specified IP addresses and things like that for the networking side of things. Any applications that are going to go on it, we'll be responsible for that. Also dealing with the uh, identity and directory services. If we're going to use something like Active Directory, or we're going to tie it to Azure Active Directory we're still going to have to manage that okay and then any devices and all of that that's going to interact with it and then the information and data that's involved in it okay so that is the important fundamentals to remember when thinking in regards to infrastructure as a service let's talk now about use cases in which I might use uh, IAAS versus PAAS versus SAAS so we'll start with uh, of course infrastructure as a service all right which means you know these are our main responsibilities here all right and we'll say IAAS right so that's infrastructure as a service and so this is you know this is going to be a solution where uh, I don't want to deal with hardware all right I don't want to deal with hardware this is, of course, a great solution as opposed to hosting things on premise, right? I don't want to deal with the headaches of hardware, so I'm going to utilize the uh, the idea of infrastructure as a service for that. The other thing is, um, I do need, okay, so imagine you do need, I do need to manage the OS, all right? So with infrastructure as a service, I do need to manage the operating system. Now, why is that? Why do I need to be able to manage the operating system? Uh, I need to be able to manage the operating system because perhaps there is uh, specialized software that needs to be installed on the operating system. Microsoft isn't going to, to be able to do that for me. I've got to do it myself. So I need to be able to set up a Windows server. I need to set up a Linux server. And I need complete control over that. All right. Um, so I need man managed to manage the operating system 100%. That is when, you know, you're going to want to go with uh, just plain old infrastructure as a service. You're going to you're going to let them host a VM for you, but you need to be able to connect into that VM and install whatever you want. Just like if you had a physical server on premise, okay, where you were going to be managing uh, everything the hardware and the software this is this is as close to that you're gonna get you're not gonna be able to manage the hardware other than picking out what hardware you want and you know maybe going with lower or higher uh, amounts of hardware but ultimately you will have control over the operating system so that is going to be your use case for that alright I'm a company perhaps I, uh, I have custom software that's built for my operating system maybe we have used this software for years it might be a a, a line of business app a, a custom line of business application that's written using c sharp you know a programming language that isn't necessarily a web-based programming language it's it's got to be installed and configured on that server so that is going to be a good use case for IAAS. All right, now with PAAS, which is going to be, we'll say this uh, this middle tier here, platform as a service, 
Now remember, with Platform as a Service, we're still getting some of the benefits that we have with, um, with Infrastructure as a Service, right? We're not having to deal with any hardware. But in this case, I also don't have to deal with the operating system. Don't want to deal with the OS, all right? I don't want to deal with the operating system, or I don't, I don't need to deal with it in this case. But I do need control over uh, web-based apps. So this is where this is really going to be benefit you. you. Maybe you've got some kind of a web-based application that your company has built. It's built using web-based programming languages. And literally all you need is a web server to, to throw your app on and it can be hosted for you. And you don't need to, to deal with the operating system layer of all that. You don't need to deal with the hardware layer of all that. All right. So, again, using something like Microsoft has what's called the uh, app service plan, where basically they supply you with a platform as a service. You pick out how much power you want, how much RAM you want. They're managing the virtual machines. They're managing the operating systems underneath. You have no, you don't have to worry about any of the control of that underlying operating system uh, or any of that okay the only thing you're responsible for is developing the application that's going to run on it so perhaps you are some kind of a e-commerce company of some kind you need a bunch of web servers they're going to manage all that now you will you have to develop the app put it in there but you can also configure it for high availability as well. So you can, con there are controls that they let you manage involving scaling out, um, scaling up, scaling out, meaning, hey, I need more performance. I need more uh, copies of the, the instances of the virtual machines. They're managing the virtual machines, but you can configure rules on, it, on scaling out. So I could say, you know, hey, when the CPU uh, reaches a certain level on my virtual machines that are, that are being managed in PAS, go ahead and scale out to multiple, and they'll, they'll do that for you. Of course, you will pay extra money when you scale out, but, um, but again, it's, it's pay for what you're, what you're using. All right, now the other side, that's one side of PAS. Now, remember that PAAS also involves uh, things that aren't necessarily for hosting web apps and all that, like Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory is considered a platform as a service. And when you when when you think about that, when you're not talking about hosting uh, any kind of virtualization and hosting apps and things like that, it's usually paid on a licensing basis. So like Azure Active Directory is a platform as a service that is, uh, is licensed. And um, it's licensed on a per user basis. So if I've got you know, if I'm paying nine dollars a month for a license that's per user, then if I've got thousand users, I'm paying nine thousand dollars a month, right? And that's how that works. Okay, so uh, depends on what you're trying to use platform as a service with, on you know, which route they go with with the payment side of it. Whether it's a, a pay for what you're using, which is what the app service plan is, where you're going to host like web apps and things like that, versus some of the different licensing capabilities they have like Azure Active Directory where you are uh, being supplied uh, access. Another example of that is Microsoft has this thing called Intune, uh, Endpoint Manager Intune, which is a, a great product that lets you control all the devices in your environment. So if you've ever used like Config Manager or something like that, um, they've got that. I, I have a course on that on Intune. It's a great product to learn and it gives you complete control over all the devices. That is another example of platform as a service. Okay. All right, all right. So now let's take a look at software as a service. All right. So this upper tier here, we're going to say is going to be our uh, software as a service. Okay. So we'll put S A A S in there. All right. That's software as a service. And with software as a service, all right. Don't want to deal with app config. So with software as a service, you don't have to deal with app, app config, or you may not want to deal with app config. Microsoft is providing the application 100% ready to go. Okay, you're not having to deal with any of the uh, the uh, app configuration at all. You're not you're not having to manage it at all. All right, uh, you are responsible for user access. So you're responsible for, for giving users access to it, okay? And that's usually done by licensing. But ultimately, you're not having to do any of the configuration of the app itself. 
um, the app is 100% ready to go. So for example, uh, Microsoft has the Office 365 applications. They have the uh, the online versions of those, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. They are 100% ready to go. Outlook is 100% ready to go. Microsoft Teams is 100% ready to go. The only thing you got to do is you, you have to license the apps and you have to issue the licenses to your users and you do that through Azure Active Directory. Okay, At that point, you instruct your users on how to get there. For example, portal.office.com they go there, the apps are ready to go. They're 100% they're ready for them to start using, and they can just jump right in and start using them. Okay, so that is what software as a service is used for. And software as a service is, is what you want to sort of think about in regards to like your end users, your end users needing access to certain things for business apps and things like that. Software as a service is going to be uh, what's going to provide that. All right, so hopefully that now gives you uh, an understanding of you know some of the use cases of each one of these the each one of these has their own place in the world and are valuable in different circumstances what you have to look at is your business model you know what is my company trying to achieve what kind of uh of a uh, um you know apps do i need what kind of services do i need and what's going to be the the best model to go with on that the other thing of course i always recommend is using the azure calculator for kind of calculating the cost of these things and get a good visualization for um, you know what might be the best solution. So should I go with a, uh, a with IAS by itself and just host virtual machines in the cloud and then manage everything myself, the operating system and the uh, the apps that go on it? Well, it depends on how much control you, you you're going to want because it, it it might be cheaper to go with a with a platform as a service, use the app service plan, and not have to deal with any of the headaches of the operating system. Um, it depends on what you're you're trying to achieve, right? Based on the, the stuff I said earlier. All right. So hopefully that now gives you a better understanding of that, and um, you now understand the the three uh, the three different models: the IAAS, PAAS, and SAAS models. Now, one of the most basic concepts in Azure that you need to keep in your head is that Azure is made up of of regions. In these regions, there are data centers. On average, there are three data centers, or three zones as they call them, uh, in each region. There are 60-something regions in the world uh, right now with Azure. Of course, they are adding more all the time. That's the reason I say 60-something, because they are adding more uh, regions all the time. So if you think about it, there are 60-something regions, and there are usually three data centers in each region, or three, as they call them, zones in each region. So there are over 180-ish uh, data centers zones in their Azure environment. When you add a resource into Azure, whatever that resource is, I don't care if it's a virtual machine or a, a virtual load balancer or a virtual firewall, it doesn't matter. Every single resource in Azure must be associated with a region. Okay, and and the data centers in that area are going to be what handles the software code for that resource. So again, if I go here to the menu button in portal.azure.com and I go down and I want to go to a virtual machine or something and I want to create a virtual machine, I have to associate that with the region. Every single resource has got to be associated with the region. And the other thing to understand about regions is the is there is different costs depending upon where that uh, that region is in the world. It may be more expensive or less expensive based on the region you go with. But you generally also want to consider that when you're creating a resource, you want that resource to be in a region that's going to be closest to the people that are going to be utilizing it. Okay, so customer wise, all right. Um, now, if you actually go to Google and just do a search for Azure uh, regions, if you click that, all right, Microsoft has a nice little article here. Choose, uh, choose the right um, Azure region for you. If you go there, they've got a nice little table here where they kind of outline all these different regions. They tell you the year that it opened. Okay, this is just in the United States that I'm looking at here. You can scroll over and you can look at these different regions when they open. Now, keep in mind the the uh, the older they are, they are, the older the equipment is. But also, you can consider that they are upgrading equipment all the time. The older regions a lot of times also have some of the newer features, but they also support older equipment, which could be cheaper if you're needing to do something that's a little more basic that you don't need anything too expensive on. But you can you can look at all these different regions here. Of course, I can you know I can go over here to look at Mexico and the mentions coming soon in Brazil and Canada. And there's also the Azure government um, side of things. 
and um, they have details about these different regions as well things like the high availability options that they have um, for that compliance related capabilities that they have available for that uh, and some of the different features you can look at in, in those regards. So those are some of the things you should definitely research depending upon what your where your business or organization is at and some of the capabilities and features that you're you're wanting to have. So uh, I want to look at a couple of other concepts with you now. So something else that's important to note here is that uh, we have something called Azure Region Pairs and we also have something called Azure Sovereign Regions. Now let's look at Azure Region Pairs first now the idea of an Azure region pair is that one of the things Microsoft tries to do is they pair regions that are somewhat close to each other. Now when I say somewhat, they can still be hundreds of miles away from each other, okay? Um, but these uh, regions will act as fault tolerant region pairs to each other, meaning you will have uh, duplicate services running in one region as from the other region, and Microsoft has uh, high-speed connectivity between those regions. Now keep in mind Azure has high-speed fiber connectivity all over the world but for region pairs they they have uh, even better high-speed connectivity in case um, some uh, data centers were to fail. So for example um, if you're talking about like a, a north central US and a south central US a north central US might be a primary region and south central US might be a secondary region and you might have Azure services running in this primary region. Well, let's say some kind of a catastrophic uh, hurricane or something came through and, and took out the, the um, data centers in that region, in the primary region, okay? Now, we don't like to think about horrible things like that, but you, you imagine, you know, you got this catastrophic uh, tornado or hurricane or, or something that, that uh, flows in Depending upon where you're where you are in the world, it might be tornadoes, it might be hurricanes, it might be earthquakes. It, you know, you can you can choose your uh, choose your battle there. <laughs> but ultimately, some kind of mass, massive disaster comes in and takes out this region. Well, these two regions are are constantly talking back and forth with each other. If one region goes down, then it can do failover. And and the reason this is possible is Microsoft has this thing called the traffic manager. And this is monitoring traffic coming in from the internet to the different regions themselves. If one region stops responding, so right now, you know, traffic might all be flooded flowing to the primary, but if that primary fails, at that point it all begins flowing to the secondary. So there is replication and all that that can happen between those region pairs. Okay, so this can provide high redundancy for your different services such as virtual machines and all that that, uh, that you get. Now, is there some additional cost involving some redundancy? Yes, there is. Um, there is some additional cost that uh, is involved there to get that high, that extra high availability. Okay, and you start looking into things like storage redundancy. There's different replication options for stores. There's different replication options for virtual machines. But I'm not getting into the details on that. I'm really just trying to help you understand the concepts of what this uh, region pair is. All right. So the next thing we have is we have what's known as um, Azure Region Sovereignty. Okay. And so you'll notice there, this is right out of Microsoft's uh, uh, knowledge base on their website there. It tells you that certain regions are dedicated to specific sovereign entities. All, although all regions are Azure regions, these sovereign regions are isolated from the rest of Azure. They are necessary. They are necessarily uh, managed by Microsoft. They aren't necessarily managed by Microsoft, but um, they, they might, there might be some restrictions to certain types of customers. And they, they mentioned these here, China, Germany, the, uh, the government of the U.S., Australia. Uh, and, of course, there are more coming in the mix. And this will involve things because there are rules on in sovereign nations on, you know, where data can travel, uh, right? So, like, you know, I might not be able to, you're in China, you can't have data over in China flowing into the U.S. So the, the most important thing of note there is to understand where you are in the world, what, what country are you dealing with, and are there any uh, rules for information traveling between these countries, okay? And this gets into compliance and all that. For example, if you're with the United States government and you're dealing with governmental data, you're part of the Azure government um, 
uh, uh, data centers, well, there that is a that is basically a private version of Azure that is only for the government, right? And information has to stay within that. It's not allowed to travel onto the onto the other regions of Azure. And so that's a consideration. You have to think about well, where am I working? Am I involved in one of these sovereign regions, or am I part of the the uh, the global public regions that are available? And we we get to kind of control how data can flow in and out of that. Now, is it possible that a public region could try to allow data to, to pass into a sovereign region? It is it is possible. You'd have to jump through lots and lots of hoops to make that happen. But that's why it's important for you to understand the compliance rules of your nation. Uh, or organization that you work with. So that's really, uh, I advise you on that uh, is to, to research, you know, where am I at? Am I I'm working for a private company? Uh, am I involved in a different country like China? Uh, am I working with a government like the United States government? And what is the, uh, the rules for dealing with the ownership of information, whether it's uh, personally identifiable information, whether it's uh, health information, private health information, whether it's a payment card industry, you know, you get into all of this uh, HIPAA compliance with the medical world and PCI DSS, payment card industry, uh, data security standards when it comes to financial and, and merchant services. And um, you have the GDPR that kind of governs allowing uh, uh, when a country gathers data uh, about customers, it has to stay within the country. So that's where you kind of have to learn about compliance in your country, in your business or your organization and be aware of the rules involved there. But that is the idea of the Azure Sovereign Region. So hopefully this, this video gives you a much better understanding of just the concepts of regions and the different kinds of uh, things you're, you're dealing with in regards to regions. Now when working with the Azure services, there's going to be various cases where you're going to come across a feature called an availability zone. Okay, The most popular time you're going to come across this is when working with virtual machines, but there's other instances where you'll see this, uh, this terminology as well. Here on portal.azure.com, if I go to the menu button to click to create a virtual machine here, you're going to see right out of the gates that you have an option here called availability options. And below that, if I choose availability zone, below that I have these different zones. Now, in Azure, there are over 60 something regions in the world. Okay, again, the reason I say 60 something is because, you know, there could be. They're, they're adding more as time goes on. And each region is made up of zones. Now, a zone is most, most of the time a zone is a different data center, but you'll also find that they have these massive warehouse size buildings where they have multiple data centers inside of these warehouse buildings, warehouse size buildings. Now, what you can do is you can pay to have a copy of your virtualization technology such as a virtual machine you can have a copy of that replicated over to another zone in the same region this means that if it, you had an entire data center outage you would still have or zone outage you would still have a different copy of your virtual machine running now if this is hard to visualize let's jump over and help let me draw this out for you to give you a better visualization of what i'm saying all right, so let's say that this entire whiteboard here is going to represent an Azure region, all right, an Azure region as a whole. So in each ra Azure region, uh, I can have a, I can have a data center. I could have a, a, a building that is dedicated to the uh, to supporting Azure services, and this would be called availability zone one all right so uh, availability zone one all right uh, that we'll put right there and in availability zone number one what do we have well that is going to have its own it's going to have its own power its own networking and its own cooling all right and then of course inside that uh, availability zone, you've also got equipment racks, right? These are gonna involve your different um, server blades and equipment and all that. So I'm just gonna kind of put lines to kind of represent, this is gonna represent our equipment racks, right? And then of course, there are databases, which we'll put 
we'll create a little cylinder here. The cylinder is going to rep represent the databases that are associated with running and storing data for that particular zone. Okay. Um, so each we have databases that handle the uh, the the data that's storing that's stored for each different zone. So all of our information is going to be stored in these different databases regarding the Azure services. So that is what makes up an actual availability zone. Okay, uh, and this could be an actual separate building, or you could have uh, one massive building in that same geographic area, big warehouse size building where that availability zone is. The key, the thing you want to remember about availability zones, it's got its own power, its own networking equipment, and its own cooling. All right. Now, if we think about this, you have three of those in each region. There's over 60 something regions, and you have three of those in each region. Okay. So you have an availability zone. We'll call this availability zone two, and then we call this availability zone three. All right. So the idea is if you have something like a virtual machine and you tell that virtual machine that it's going to be stored in multiple availability zones, okay, then um, a copy of that virtual machine is going to be stored, you know, in this first availability zone, okay. But if you say, hey, I want it to be stored in the others, then what happens is it will replicate itself to these other availability zones. And what's beautiful about that is it's extremely fast replication. Uh, that replication can um, essentially, as as the virtual machines are being used, it can instantly, almost instantly, replicate over to these other availability zones because it's in the same region. Okay, um, and so this is where you get into what's called synchronous replication, where replication happens. As things change, it's happening immediately, and you also have what's called asynchronous replication, where uh, a change may occur in one location first, and then it'll eventually replicate out. So anyway, um, you, your your virtual machines are replicated in those different places. So so why is that so important? Because think about it, the power could go out in this one availability zone, networking could go out, uh, you might not have cooling, and so this availability zone is no longer accessible. But luckily traffic can be redirected to one of these other availability zones completely. Now, there is one thing we do have to consider about all of that, and that is what happens if something catastrophic occurs where uh, maybe you're talking about a tornado, hurricane, you're talking an earthquake, uh, some kind of major fire in the area that somehow affects the, the, the building. Um, uh, power grid goes out for a whole region. Well, at that point, the whole region would be down. So the thing to understand about availability zones, they are not going to protect you from a region outage. They're only going to protect you from a zone outage or data center outage. Uh, so, you know, one of these data centers goes down, no problem. You're not going to really see any, any downtime whatsoever. So that is the idea of availability zones. Let's now take a look at uh, resource groups. Now, uh, the thing about Azure that's very important to understand is that you are going to be adding resources. These resources may or may not cost money. Some resources are free. Some resources cost money. Of course, you can use the Azure calculator to determine what's going to cost money. Uh, now, the most important thing of note there, though, is that resources have to be in a container. That container is called a resource group. Okay, resource groups cannot be nested. That's something you want to remember. Okay, resources group resource groups cannot be nested. You can't have a resource group inside of another resource group. Okay, um, so you have to kind of think about how you want to break your resource groups up. Okay, uh, resource groups can um, can can contain all sorts of different resources or a mixture, in other words. Or if you want to keep the same resources 
in a specific resource group, you can do that. For example, I might have a resource group called virtual machines where I only have virtual machines. I might have a resource group called uh, databases that I only keep databases. I might have a resource group called uh, storage accounts that I only keep storage accounts. Or in some cases, it may be a good idea based on what a project you're on. You might name a resource group after a project that you're working on, and it might contain uh, a virtual machine, a SQL database, as well as uh, a storage account. Um, so sometimes you mix them together. The good news is, for the most part, you can also move things uh, between resource groups as well. All right, um, it's not necessarily set in stone. Once you you know create a resource group, the resources have to stay in the same resource group. You can move them, but you do want to do a little planning when you're creating your resource groups. So how do we do this exactly? Well, um, first off, here I am on portal.azure.com. You'll see I have resource groups here. Keep in mind, you may not see this up here at the top always. So you can always click the little menu button, and you'll notice that resource groups are always going to be a favorite. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. And you can see I have a couple of resource groups here. But I'm going to go ahead and click Create. All right, and from there, I have to select my subscription. Okay, resource groups have to be associated with a subscription. All right, and then you can give the resource group a name. Okay, so you can name the resource group what you want. Okay, I'm going to call this um, I'm going to call this uh, demo RG for resource group. All right, now notice I kept all that together. I am allowed to use capitalization. Uh, if I try to give it a space, you'll notice I can't do that. Right? I, uh, what about a dash? I can do a dash. I can do an underscore. Uh, all that's fine. Uh, but you can't put a space in a resource group name. All right. Then you specify the region. Remember that the region is going to involve uh, the set of data centers that the resource group is going to be tied to. Now, interestingly enough, even though you select a certain region for a resource group, the resource group component will be stored in that data center. But you can actually include resources from a different region. That is allowed. You are allowed to do that. All right. So it's kind of funny when you think about the container for these resources being in one data center in one part of the world and then the resources themselves being stored uh, in a different data center that's linked to that container. But you can do that. All right. All right. So from then, I'm going to click on uh, review and create. Uh, I'm not going to talk about tags right now, but I'm going to click review and create. Uh, at that point, I can click create and I'm now officially created my resource group. Okay, so from there, resource groups are one of the fastest things you can create in Azure, and they don't cost you any money. Uh, I'm going to click on Demo RG, so there's my resource group, and you'll see I have all these different blades that are available to me um, to take a look at, including one of the things I really love is looking at cost analysis and all that involving just this resource group. So instead of me having to go to my subscription and look at the cost analysis as a whole, I can look at the cost analysis uh, for just this resource group. Of course, right now, there's nothing in it, so it's not going to really cost you any money, right? All right. From there, uh, you can begin adding resources. So, for example, I could say create. There's, there's a couple of different ways you can add a resource to a resource group. You can click create here, and then you have all the different uh, available resources that, uh, that you have uh, uh, open to you in Azure to add to that resource group, which, of course, I will be adding. I'm not going to add any resources right now, but I will be adding. Another way, though, of adding a resource to a resource group is uh, I can, like, if I wanted to add a storage account here, let's say storage, all right, it does help if you can spell. Um, I can say storage, and so you've got different storage account-based options here. Uh, or if you click the menu button and you go to all services, you can see all of their uh, resources available through this as well, right? And uh, if you do a search for the word storage, uh, you could find the different storage. Again, it does, again, help if you spell things correctly. I don't always spell things very well when I'm talking, but <laughs> uh, you'll see the different things involving storage here. So I could click on storage account. And the interesting thing about that is you can go to a resource and click to create a resource. And then when you go to create a resource, you then would select a resource group for it to be in. So you have a couple different ways, obviously, there that... When you want to add a resource to a, uh, a resource group, you can either add it um, directly by going through all services and clicking the resource and creating it, or go into the resource group itself and click create, and it'll add it that way. Okay, so various ways that you could do it. Of course, if you do this through PowerShell and or through Azure's uh, CLI, which is the the um, Linux Bash Space Shell, 
uh, you have to specify a resource group for the resource to go in as well, which I'm not getting into, into the command line stuff right now. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Either way, you always have to specify a resource group for a resource uh, to go in. All in all, though, resource groups are pretty easy to deal with. Main thing is, remember, you can't nest them. Now, in Azure, you have resources. Resources are the different objects that you want to add and manage and uh, work with well, that pretty much lets you do stuff in Azure, right? Um, but in order to add resources, you have to have what's called a subscription. A subscription is going to be your payment method. It's usually going to be associated with a credit card. And uh, you can, from there, start adding resources. Okay. Um, to take a look at our subscriptions, we're just going to go to the menu button here. We're going to go to All Services, and then you can do a search for subscription. And you may say, well, I, I noticed you could click subscription from the, the Home tab or whatever. That doesn't, that, it's not always there. So um, one way you can always find subscriptions is to click the menu button and go to All Services and do a search for subscription. If you know you're going to be playing with subscriptions a lot, you can highlight it, click the little star icon, and then subscriptions will begin showing up on the left side of your screen. As you can see right here, I've made it a favorite, basically. But if I go to subscriptions, you can see I have one subscription. If I want to add an additional subscription, I can. All right, go through there, specify the information, billing information, uh, and then you can add another subscription. So it can be associated with a you know different um, a different uh, credit card or payment method that you want to use and you'll then have multiple subscriptions and if you want to associate those with different management groups you can and then don't forget too that once you've set up a subscription you can give authority over certain individuals who can create items underneath that subscription so people that you want to be able to go and uh, you know you can you can give them the ability to um, add uh, um, resources you can make them a contributor if you want or give somebody complete power if they're an owner but ultimately managing subscriptions is pretty straightforward now let's talk about uh, management groups management groups uh, again are utilized to help group and categorize our subscriptions together okay subscriptions being what we're going to use to pay for our different resources in Azure uh, now with management groups we don't necessarily have to have a management group um, in fact, you don't really start out with management groups when you create a new tenant, okay? You have to go in and basically say, okay, I want to start using management groups, and then at that point I can create uh, subcategories for management groups. Ultimately, though, a management group is just a way for us to group together our subscriptions, and then we can give authority over uh, certain management groups to certain individuals and those individuals will have authority over those subscriptions so to do this we just go to the menu button here on portal.azure.com we're going to go to all services we search for the words management group okay if you search for that you'll see management groups appear right here we're going to click on that and then you would click to create to start using a management group when you first come in here you won't see anything there you'll have to tell it you want to start using management groups it takes a couple of minutes and then when you come back and refresh the screen you should have your root management group and it'll associate your subscription directly under that uh, at that point if uh, you want to create a new management group and create the subcategory for that or, or sub management groups child management groups you can do that here notice it tells you that your management group ID says cannot be updated after creation so if I call this production okay um, notice that I can't call it uh, production group all right if I say production group you'll notice that it doesn't allow the spaces to be there I could take that away if I wanted now on this name this is sort of the friendly name you could call it production group if you wanted to all right and so from there you can create your management group and you can add your subscriptions to your management group and you can set your uh, role privileges and all that for your management group so in this video I want to help you kind of put everything together involving the hierarchical system for management of Azure resources so at the top level uh, again, you have management groups, right? Management groups, they're going to be there to help you manage the access to policies and compliance and basically help organize multiple subscriptions here, right? So you're going to have, you might have different subscriptions that you are going to be utilizing for maybe different departments or different parts of your organization that, uh, that need uh, different financial need, ha uh, they have different financial needs. And your management groups are going to help you with organizing those, right? Um, below that, of course, are your subscriptions, and your subscriptions are going to be associated 
with uh, various user accounts that have been given access to um, uh, uh, control things like quotas, which is going to involve how much they can spend, you know, limits, uh, limits on spending, as well as uh, quota management, and basically organize the cost of the different resources that they are dealing with in Azure. And you'll have different subscriptions that are going to be associated maybe with different people that are under the control of that. Now below that, you have resource groups, right? Your resource groups are the main parent object that you have for managing your resources. Uh, it, it, a lot of people like to think of it as a folder. I don't really like to think of it as a folder just because um, you know you can't have you can have folders underneath folders in a file system but you can't have resource groups under other resource groups of course again you need to remember that you can't nest resource groups resource groups can however they can contain resources uh, of the same type or different type the other thing about uh, resource groups is that they can contain resources in different regions so even though maybe I've got a resource group that is you know East US I can have a resource that's located in West US if I want so it's a it's kind of an interesting concept when you think about you've got a resource that's located in uh, one data center in one region but the resources that are uh, are inside of it can actually be hosted somewhere else now it may not be the most efficient way to you know efficient to handle it that way but you can do that it's not a uh, it's not a restriction okay so resource groups are there to handle your various resources right at that bottom level the resources can be all sorts of different things from things like you know virtual machines virtual networks you have databases you have other computing resources that are used you have storage you have various things here that fall into that category of resources and those have to go in resource groups and of course what you'll find is going back up to this top level where they mention this word policy right here um, you can apply Azure policies that can place restrictions and things restrictions as well as compliance rules on the various levels placing these uh, these policies of course at the higher level is going to filter down to all the lower levels um, at management group maybe placing them at the subscription level is going to filter down to these lower levels you can also have uh, Azure policies that are placed directly on resource groups that are just going to filter down to those levels uh, or you can also apply things directly to resources themselves so this is the important thing generally speaking when you place uh, uh, re uh, restrictions and, and compliance rules and all that at higher levels it's going to filter down to lower levels uh, of course if you you just place them at the lower levels you're gonna affect less but you can be more specific about what you're affecting so uh, ultimately though that is the idea of the um, dealing with your resource groups subscriptions and management groups and the hierarchical system that you use to manage it hey this is John Christopher I hope you enjoyed getting to experience a little bit of this course and I hope you'll join me on the full adventure if you'll check the description of this video you'll see a link that'll show you how you can get access to the full course now in the full course you're gonna learn how to set up a practice environment where you can practice hands-on and I'm gonna provide you with lots of virtual simulations that you can do 24 7 all you need is a web browser so I hope you'll join me and uh, I hope you'll also give me a like and subscribe. I'm trying very, very hard to get the this channel to build and grow. And uh, so I hope you'll take the time to do that.